Welcome back to World Religions. This video is going to be an introduction and overview of Buddhism. We're going to start with a historical overview of Buddhism from its founding up to just before the modern era. Buddhism you could define as a religion based on the Dharma, the law or teaching of the Buddha. Dharma uh, is a term also used in other Indian religions like Hinduism. Uh, in Buddhism, it's referring to the law or the teaching of the Buddha, the founder of the religion. It can also be used just to refer to reality or the way things are, which Buddhists believe is reflected in the Buddhist teaching. Buddha is a title that means a being with knowledge. Um, there's also a traditional etymology or history of the word Buddha and Bodhi, which traces it back to a word that means awake. So it's sometimes translated into English as the awakened one. Although um, there are people who criticize that interpretation, like the modern Buddhist monk and scholar Bhikkhu Bodhi has argued that um, Buddha probably just means the knowledgeable one or the one with knowledge. And he favors using the word enlightened one um, and interpreting Bodhi, which the word Buddha comes from as referring to enlightenment or knowledge. So Buddha again is a title, meaning a being that has Bodhi and Bodhi could be translated as awakening, enlightenment or knowledge. It's referring specifically to the type of knowledge that ends suffering. That's the key goal of Buddhism. Uh, and according to Buddhists, the Buddha discovered the path to ending suffering permanently. Um, according to Buddhism, there are many Buddhas. The historical founder of the religion, Siddhartha Gautama, was only the last Buddha in our world and in our age. And there will be future Buddhas in our world um, in future ages. There are also other universes or world systems out there that have their own Buddhas. Um, but if the word Buddha is just used on its own, typically it's a reference to Siddhartha Gautama, historically speaking, uh, who founded the religion. Siddhartha Gautama is also distinguished from other uh, Buddhas by his title Shakyamuni. Muni means sage or wise person, and Shakya is the clan or tribe that Siddhartha came from. So Shakyamuni would mean the sage of the Shakya people. Um, the picture on the slide is of a Dharma wheel. This is a symbolic representation of the Buddha's teaching. Uh, this one has eight spokes, which is generally interpreted as referring to the Noble Eightfold Path the eight main aspects of practice that a Buddhist is supposed to follow, about which more later. There um, is also another more ancient or traditional way of depicting the Dharma wheel that has 12 spokes, which is a reference to the Four Noble Truths, a summary of Buddhist doctrine, um, each of which is, according to one of the Buddha's sermons, uh, to be understood and applied and fulfilled or realized in three different ways. So you have um, four noble truths times the three ways that they're developed or fulfilled, and you get the 12 spokes of a more ancient form of the Dharma wheel. So who was Siddhartha Gautama? Uh, he was born into the Gautama clan, hence his surname. His given name, Siddhartha, was a common name for ancient uh, noble men in, in ancient India. Uh, it comes from Sanskrit words uh, Siddha, which means power, and Artha, which means success. So it would be given for um, the names of some uh, Kshatriyas, or men born into the class of, of noble warriors that owned a lot of the land in traditional India. Uh, he was known as the Buddha um, or other titles like Shakyamuni after he attained enlightenment, after he attained Bodhi. So uh, according to the traditional dates often given by Buddhists, uh, he lived between 563 and 483 BC. Um, these dates were developed in modern times, but they're traditional in the sense that they reflect 
um, the the teachings, the understandings of Buddhists uh, about their own tradition. Um, the common view is that the Buddha lived for 80 years, and that is accepted as probably uh, historically accurate by a lot of modern scholars. However, modern scholars disagree about when the Buddha actually lived. They generally think he was a historical person, but most of the modern estimates place him in the 5th century BC, so a few decades after um, the more traditional dates, and that he may have died around 400 BC. This is during the period of Indian history when a lot of the other sects and religions were being founded along the Ganges River Valley. So uh, the Buddha is teaching and active and founding his religion shortly after the founding of Jainism and around the same time as other ancient schools of Hindu thought like the ones that produced the Upanishads and also uh, Sankhya philosophy. All of that was happening around the same time as the Buddha, or maybe a little bit before. So uh, we have some accounts of the life of Siddhartha Gautama from the Pali Canon, which is the oldest complete collection of Buddhist scriptures, about which more later. According to the Pali Canon, Siddhartha was born into the Shakya people or tribe, uh, he was from a uh, upper class, so later Buddhist tradition regards him as being the son or prince of a powerful king. But historically speaking, at least according to the more historically reliable descriptions in the Pali Canon, he's just uh, described as being a kshatriya or noble. Um, but he decides to renounce the world after he contemplates the fact that he will get old, he will get sick, and he will die. He describes himself in the Pali Canon as when he was young, being um, uh, having a kind of refined upbringing. So he had like luxurious clothing and um, uh, ointments and incenses and things like that. Um, and he had different places he could live based on the seasons. So he did have um, a wealthier upper class upbringing. And he also describes himself as initially being intoxicated with youth, health, and life. But he started to reflect on the fact that these things are impermanent and that kind of set him on a spiritual quest to find something that would not grow old, die, get sick, etc. So he uh, leaves home this is described in the Pali Canon as something he does in front of his parents. So he cuts off his hair and gives up his, um, his fine garments and things. And his parents are weeping when they realize that he's not going to stay at home. He's not going to inherit his father's legacy. He's not going to have a family and kids and a worldly existence. He's going to strive for this... Um, this transcendent or otherworldly knowledge or salvation. So he leaves home, he becomes a renunciate, and he studies under two teachers before he finds his own knowledge and his own enlightenment. He studies under Alara Kalama and Uddhika Ramaputta. These teachers teach him various meditation techniques, and he is able to attain very advanced states of concentration or meditation that temporarily get rid of the ordinary sufferings and limitations of a worldly existence, you might say. However, he reflects, even though he masters the, the meditation techniques and the teachings uh, of each of his two teachers, he reflects that the states of concentration he's able to attain are not permanent and they also don't hit, give him complete enlightenment, knowledge, or bodhi that he's seeking. So he eventually leaves to practice on his own and he tries more extreme forms of asceticism or renunciation, such as fasting for very long periods. He does this with five other ascetics or renunciates um, who form kind of like a little community in the forest, in the wilderness um, to give each other encouragement and discipline. Uh, it, he describes himself as fasting for so long that, for example, you could see each vertebrae on his back because he had lost so much weight. And he was lightheaded such that if he 
stood up or even tried to answer the call of nature, he would fall down or faint. So all of these things are described in kind of graphic detail in the Pali Canon. He ends up realizing that this extreme asceticism, which he regards himself as having taken to the physical limit of what his body is able to tolerate without death, did still not lead to enlightenment. So he decides to break his fast. He gets some rice uh, gruel from a layperson who um, gives that to him. It was a common practice in ancient India, India for lay people to give uh, food or other offerings to monks or holy men of various types. It was regarded as an act of merit or good karma. So um, that breaking of his fast, it makes the other hermits uh, later on kind of um, disgusted at him because they think he's gone soft and given up, but it gives him enough strength and energy to recommit himself to the path to enlightenment. And he finds a large pipal or fig tree um, and decides to sit under it and meditate there until he's able to attain enlightenment or die trying. He does succeed in attaining enlightenment under the tree, which gets called the Bodhi tree or the tree of knowledge to reflect that fact. Um, he basically is able to remember that when he was a boy, he has this memory of um, watching his father working in the fields, sitting under or beside a tree and spontaneously entering into a state of meditation, which was pleasant, but still wholesome or good for, for him and his state of being. And so he decides that not all pleasures are bad, not all pleasures to be avoided. That was the mistake he made when he was practicing extreme asceticism. Now, bodily or worldly pleasures are usually bad, but the pleasures of meditation, of having a, a pure state of mind, those are good. And so that's the kind of initial insight that he develops while meditating under the Bodhi tree. He just takes that to its natural fulfillment or culmination. He discovers the Dharma or the law of the nature of suffering and how to end it. Teaches, And after he attains enlightenment, he eventually um, is persuaded by a, a god who appears before him who wants him to teach this dharma, this truth, to others. And the god encourages him. Uh, it's one of the brahmas or um, higher gods in Buddhist cosmology, about which more later. Um, the god encourages him to teach his dharma to other people. He's able to know through kind of a miraculous vision where uh, his fellow ascetics were, the five that he formerly practiced with. And then he travels on foot to where they are and then teaches him the first sermon or sutra of the Buddha, which is called the Dhamma Chaka Pavatana Sutta, which means the sutta or discourse on the turning of the wheel of Dhamma or Dharma. So that wheel uh, is a symbol of the various aspects of the Buddha's Dharma or teaching. And he sets the wheel in motion metaphorically by teaching it to these ascetics. They become his followers. They become the first uh, ordained Buddhist monks. He continues to teach and gather many followers, both other monks, later nuns, and lay people, both male and female, for another 40 years until he dies and attains what's called pari nirvana, perfect or complete release um, in Buddhism. So he attains enlightenment bodhi, which also is the state of nirvana while he's still alive. But Buddhists also talk about pari nirvana, which is that state of enlightenment where you have no suffering and perfect wisdom and knowledge. That state continues after the death of your last body. You no longer get reincarnated into samsara or the cycle of reincarnation based on your karma. You attain complete release from anything physical, worldly, or related to samsara after the death of your last body. So that's called pari nirvana or perfect, complete release. Uh, I mentioned the Pali Canon uh, is the most complete um, ancient Buddhist scripture that contains a few details of the life of the Buddha, some of which I mentioned on a previous slide. So the thing that the Pali Canon does not do is give a single systematic biography um, that describes the complete life of the Buddha. He, um, the Pali Canon includes a collection of all the sutras or teachings delivered by the Buddha while he was alive. And he would often refer to previous incidents in his life, including to before he became enlightened. 
So you can kind of piece these together to uh, create a partial biography. But there were later Buddhist biographies written that included um, a lot of additional information, much of which is probably legendary in terms of uh, a modern uh, scholarly perspective. So a lot of these aspects of the later biographies are believed in by Buddhists, but historically speaking, they didn't all probably happen. So what are some of the examples of new teachings about the life of the Buddha that are introduced in these later accounts? Siddhartha is described as the son not just of a noble or kshatriya, but of a powerful king. Um, and his, his father is described as being very wealthy, very powerful. The trappings of his father and his palace and his court also reflect those of a slightly later um, ancient India that was, was several centuries after the time that the Buddha actually lived. And it makes sense because that was the time in which some of these more legendary accounts were written. They also describe significantly the nature of his decision to leave home and to become an ascetic or renunciate in a different way. So the Pali Canon um, portrays him as doing this in front of his parents, and they're even uh, sad and weeping about it. Whereas in the legendary account, um, his father doesn't want him to become an ascetic. So there's more of like a drama that's created. His father wants him to become a powerful king, an emperor who will rule over the world, which was what was prophesied of the Buddha by a Brahmin when he was born. Based on the signs that he was born under, either he would become a great religious teacher and help save the world, or he would become a great king and rule the world. And his father was more of a worldly bent, at least initially, and wanted him to become a world king or emperor. So he tries to keep him sheltered from anything related to religion, spirituality, or the downside of a worldly existence. And so in order to escape this, Siddhartha has to um, sneak out of the palace at night under cover of darkness. And the later legendary biographies also portray him as having a wife and son, uh, Rahula. Rahula is uh, mentioned in early scriptures, but he's not identified there as the son of the Buddha. So it's possible that the Buddha never actually was married or had a, a child. Those might have been introduced into the later legendary accounts, in part because they're emphasizing the contrast of his life as a noble and a prince, which was very worldly, whereas later on he renounces all that. Although in the legendary versions, um, his wife uh, and son become his students. They become a, a nun and a monk, and they also attain enlightenment under the um, Buddha's teachings. By the way, the picture on the slide is an example of a common uh, iconography or way of depicting the Buddha. This one, though, shows Greek influence. Um, it's from one of those uh, kingdoms in what's now Afghanistan uh, and northern Pakistan. And in ancient times, there were kingdoms in Gandhara and elsewhere around there where some of the Greek-speaking kings converted to Buddhism. They had Greek craftsmen working for them. And so some of those uh, craftsmen made images that were showing a, a Greek a pictorial influence, even though they were Buddhist in nature. And some of the aspects of, of that style of depicting the Buddha, like the way the robes are depicted, um, some other aspects of the Buddha that are similar to ancient Greek depictions of Apollo, those entered into some later Buddhist iconography as, as well. Um, but yeah, that's the, the Buddha seated there. He's often shown seated, and he may be um, teaching. The mudras or the hand gestures are also significant. So um, there are ones that show that he's teaching the Dharma, for example, whereas other ones may show him in meditation or that he's offering protection and, and so on. So what is the discovery um, of the Buddha? What knowledge did he discover and teach to others? A lot of the teaching is surrounding the existence of suffering or dukkha. Dukkha can also mean pain or discomfort or anything that mars a state of ease. You could call it dis-ease in the sense of a lack of ease, a lack of tranquility, a lack of peace. So according to um, the Buddha, until or unless a being attains Bodhi, enlightenment, they're going to be in a state of suffering to one degree or another. He defines suffering as clinging. 
So it's a mental state of attachment or clinging to what he calls the five aggregates. The five aggregates are um, a way of classifying mental and physical phenomena. So basically this is a um, phenomenological analysis as a modern philosopher would put it. It's trying to classify or analyze different aspects of our experience or phenomena. Some of these are physical, like uh, physical objects that we know through the five senses, but others are mental or psychological. Um, so the point of the classification scheme is just analyzing all of the components of your experience, but the relation to suffering is that suffering emerges not from the mere existence of the phenomena. Um, like for example, one of the five aggregates is rupa, which means form. That includes physical objects and our perceptions of them. Another of the five aggregates is feeling, whether pleasant, painful, or neutral. Having all of those experiences, even of pain, is not the same as suffering in Buddhism. So what is the suffering? The suffering is the clinging, kind of like our psychological or mental response to those phenomena. So if we try to cling to them uh, or resist them even, that would be kind of like reverse clinging then, that very clinging is the suffering. So the cause of why do we cling to things um, is craving. Um, so that's basically a type of desire, but it's a desire in a specific sense. It's a desire that involves uh, a sense of self or ego. Um, and so it's not necessarily any desire. That's kind of a common misunderstanding. The Buddhist view, uh, arguably, is that Certain types of desires are not part of craving, clinging, or suffering. What types of desires would those be? Those are basically desires for the authentic, overall, long-term well-being or good of um, a person or other beings, other sentient beings. So if you will your own genuine good or that of others, you could call that a type of desire, but that's not the same as craving in Buddhism. So why do people have craving? Well, according to Buddhism, the ultimate cause of suffering, clinging, and craving is ignorance or delusion. It's not seeing the way things really are. So one aspect of this, or one way of understanding it, is that the various phenomena that we experience, mental, physical, all the five aggregates, those are impermanent. They're always changing. So trying to cling to them will inevitably produce frustration and as well as the clinging itself already being a kind of uh, pain or dis-ease or irritation in the mind even before things change and you suffer loss so that's just one aspect of the buddhist understanding of the ignorance or delusion that keeps people or really sentient beings which are called bhavas um, keeps these beings trapped in suffering, trapped in samsara, the cycle of life, death, and rebirth, but always involving loss, always involving pain. So how do you bring this suffering and this endless cycle of suffering to an end? The sentient beings or bhavas will continue to be reborn or reincarnate in samsara. That's the cycle of death and rebirth until they're able to end their craving and clinging. That's the only way it can come to an end. And how do you do that? Well, you have to see things the way they really are. If you understand that on a deep, profound, complete level, that's the way um, that you can end the craving, end the clinging, and thus end the suffering. The picture on the slide is of the so-called four sights of the Buddha. Um, these are a sick man, an old man, and a dead man. Um, the fourth of the sights is of a renunciate, who renounces the world for the sake of salvation. Um, and this is connected to the legendary biographies of the Buddha, where uh, he didn't even know about sickness, about old age, or about death, because his father had kept him sheltered from all these things, because he didn't want his son Siddhartha to realize the world is not ultimately satisfying, and to seek for a religious, spiritual, transcendent goal instead. But one night, the Buddha convinced his charioteer to take him in the, the, the royal chariot or the princely chariot outside of the walls of the palace. And the gods arranged it so that he could um, have these four sights. He saw 
someone who was old, someone who was sick, someone who was dead, and a fourth being not shown on this picture uh, of a, a hermit or monk who had renounced the world to find permanent enlightenment or salvation, you might say. So uh, this also shows you that even though um, the later accounts are probably legendary, they have the biggest impact on how a lot of Buddhists understand the life of Siddhartha uh, before he became the Buddha um, and even after. Um, and this one, I think, is from Thailand, but you see similar um, depictions of the four sites in uh, other Buddhist countries, too. So I mentioned this idea of impermanence. Things are always changing. This is actually a teaching of Buddhism. Um, the next section will have a more um, systematic laying out of some of the main doctrines or beliefs of Buddhism. But uh, in this section, even though it's just a historical overview, it's worth going over some of these in detail so we can understand what did the Buddha teach while he was alive and, and how people kind of understood what Buddhism was as it spread throughout the world. So impermanence is the teaching that all uh, phenomena, which usually in Buddhism refers to aspects of samsara or conditioned reality, conditioned existence. These are things that are conditioned and that they're dependent on other things. They don't have an absolute or permanent or unending existence. All of these conditioned realities that we experience through the ordinary mind and through the senses, both physical and psychological, these are not eternal. They're impermanent. They are always changing um, in subtle ways, and eventually they will disappear entirely when their conditions change or come to an end. By the very fact that they're conditioned or causally dependent, that means when their causes vary or go away, they too will vary or go away. So this is called sometimes this, that conditionality by Buddhists. And it was one of the main teachings of the Buddha that can be summarized as when this changes, that changes. Uh, so the problem is people tend to crave these impermanent conditioned things. And that causes suffering in two ways. Um, very, the very craving that leads to clinging, the clinging itself is the suffering. So even if hypothetically there were something eternal, even if you're clinging to it, that very clinging itself is suffering. But also it sets, you up, sets yourself up for additional um, suffering when the thing that you crave and cling to changes or goes away. So some other important teachings of Buddhism, not self, is anatta or anatman. You may notice as we go through these slides, a lot of the terms for um, Buddhist concepts, there's different spellings of them. That's because there are different languages, mainly Pali and Sanskrit, in which uh, Buddhist teachings are recorded and transmitted. The oldest complete collection of the Buddhist teachings is the Pali Canon, written in the language of Pali. This is uh, close to the language of the Buddha himself and others around his time. So anatta is the Pali way of saying no self or not self, whereas anatman is actually the way of saying it in Sanskrit. Somewhat ironically, Pali is a later version or an evolution of the Sanskrit language. But the oldest complete collection of the Buddhist scriptures are in Pali. So what happened was after the death of the Buddha, his teachings were remembered in Pali, which is similar to how he actually spoke them. But later on, Sanskrit became the standard language for religion, philosophy, and scholarship in India because it was the language that was known by all of the Brahmins, priests, and others who engaged in scholarship. So the older form of the language, Sanskrit, became used for some of the later Buddhist scriptures and philosophical treatises. Sometimes uh, people use the Pali spelling, sometimes people use the Sanskrit spelling. That's why I will often give both, just for the sake of clarity. Atman is a Sanskrit word that means self or soul. The teaching of the Atman is very important for some other ancient Indian religions, namely Hinduism and Jainism. Those religions have different theologies and other doctrines, but they both believe not only in a self or soul, Atman, but that the self or soul is eternal. And Hindus believe 
that the um, true nature of the soul is kind of uh, revealed or understood when it unites with Brahman, God or the Supreme Being. Jains believe that the soul is eternal and self-luminous and all-knowing and blissful, um, but they don't connect that with a doctrine of God or a supreme being. Um, for Jainism, the soul attains salvation uh, or liberation when it realizes its own nature and separates from everything else. For Hinduism, the usual teaching is that the soul attains liberation or moksha, when it unites with God or Brahman. Well, Buddhism is different from both of those teachings because not only does Buddhism deny Brahman, God or a supreme being like Jainism, but Buddhism even denies the existence of a soul. So that's connected in part to the not self or on Atman teaching. So there's another dimension to not self though, which is more of a practical or pragmatic teaching that bhavas, sentient beings or conscious beings, which for Buddhism includes humans, but also other types of beings that have consciousness and karma like gods, demons, uh, giants, uh, animals, ghosts, etc. Any being with karma, um, these beings are on Atman. They lack a soul in a permanent sense, but also they should regard phenomena as not themselves as not self so the practical side of the not self teaching is you don't identify with the aspects of your conscious experience all of those physical and mental phenomena uh, so for example don't regard wealth as your own don't regard power as your own don't even regard your own physical body as your own all of these things are just phenomena, but if you don't identify with them, you won't cling to them, and so you won't have suffering around them. That's uh, the basic uh, practical side of the not-self teaching. So according to a Buddhism, well, if there's no souls, then what are these beings that are conscious, and, and what is being reincarnated? Now, this is a difficult thing to understand or explain, but... The basic teaching is that all of these conscious beings that are trapped in samsara, in a sense, you might say they're permanent, even though that's not um, the, the way that Buddhists would usually describe it, because there's no single thing about them that's eternal or permanent or lasts forever. Rather, they're always changing, and they don't have a fixed nature that's eternal. So what do they have? They have a succession of conscious states states of awareness, states of consciousness. But all of these are just an ever-flowing stream. It's always changing, always flowing. And each current state of consciousness or awareness is conditioned causally, causally affected by the past karma of this being. Karma is action or intention. And the Buddha defines the inner nature of karma as those intentions, as those inner thoughts or occasions of willing. So it's the karma that is causally shaping or weaving or influencing the present and future states of being of a, a conscious being. And the, the karma of a being, the causal interconnectedness of intention and result, that's what actually gives the, the kind of identity um, or continuous thread of a being over time, not an eternal soul with a fixed nature per se. So karma is kind of like the ultimate driver that causes all of the phenomena, all of the mental and physical experience that a conscious being has, both in this life and in their future lives as well. So rebirth or reincarnation in Buddhism is like in Hinduism, Jainism, something connected to karma. Your karma, your action, or your inner intention is what creates not only your future experiences in this life, but also the occasions and nature of your future lives as well. Each uh, rebirth, each reincarnation will be met ultimately with old age, sickness, and death. There's always separation and loss. And that's partly why, even though the cycle goes on forever, it's not regarded as a good thing in Buddhism. Rather, the fact that you will continually reincarnate means you're going to continue to suffer loss and other types of suffering until you end it by attaining nirvana. 
Nirvana means unbinding in the literal translation. Uh, so what is that a reference to? There's different interpretations of it. Probably historically speaking, it originates in the ancient Indian conception of fire, which is a metaphor used by the Buddha for samsara. And nirvana is the opposite of that. It's the extinction of the fire. And why would that be called nirvana? Well, in um, ancient Indian thought, and I'm getting this largely from Tanisaro Bhikkhu, who's a modern uh, American-born Buddhist teacher in the Thai forest tradition. But um, nirvana, or, sorry, fire was thought of as clinging to its fuel in ancient India. And when you put out the fire, when you extinguish it, it is released. It's no longer binding to its fuel um, and is kind of diffuse in the universe and can be rekindled later. So when the fire burns, it's stuck to its fuel. It can't get beyond, you know, that, that wood or whatever it's burning, that oil. And then later on, when it's extinguished, then it's still kind of there in potential form throughout the universe, but it's no longer um, stuck to that particular fuel source. Um, so nirvana is thought of as a good thing. It's the extinction or end, not of consciousness or not of being in an absolute sense, but rather of craving, clinging, and suffering. So it's the permanent end of suffering and the attainment of bodhi or enlightenment. Nirvana and bodhi are basically two ways of describing or two aspects of the same reality, the same state of being. Um, or you could also say that nirvana is um, the thing that is realized uh, by a being who has bodhi, who has the knowledge, who has the wisdom. The way that the Buddha describes nirvana, it refers both to a state of being, but also to an eternal permanent reality that's beyond samsara, that is discovered by a being who attains that awareness. So attaining nirvana is what ends the cycle of rebirth, reincarnation. It ends craving, clinging, and suffering. And how do you attain nirvana? Well, you have to systematically develop the Noble Eightfold Path, which consists of three main parts. Following moral rules, developing your mind through meditation, and attaining wisdom and insight into the nature of reality. You can see in the picture on the slide a wheel in the center. That's a symbol for the Buddha and his Dharma. And you can see other beings honoring and worshiping that to either side. Another aspect of the Buddha's life and teaching is the Sangha, which means the assembly or gathering. Specifically, it's referring to the group of monks and nuns who are following the teachings of the Buddha fully and trying to attain Nirvana. So monks and nuns live on alms, food and other offerings by lay people. They renounce the world, including wealth, family, uh, career, everything worldly, and they follow the Buddha's path to enlightenment, and they teach the Dharma to others, both other monks and lay people. The Buddha taught a code of conduct, or Vinaya, to govern the Sangha, and this is one of the main three divisions of the scriptures of the Pali Canon. You can see in the picture on the slide, the Buddha surrounded by his other monks. The monks wear uh, saffron robes, and the color of this can often be a yellowish, orangish, or sometimes a reddish color, depending on the country. But um, the saffron dye was used in part to um, help clean robes that were from, uh, sometimes uh, monks would make patchwork robes from rags that have been cast off by others. But the saffron color had a kind of practical use um, as a kind of disinfectant, but also it was a way of marking off the followers of the Buddha from other groups of renunciates or religious in, in ancient India. So the Buddha was the head of the Sangha when he was alive. He taught it uh, all the teachings of the Dharma. He taught it uh, codes of conduct rules that are in the Vinaya Pitaka of the Pali Canon. But he did not appoint a single successor, a single person to lead him, uh, to succeed him as leader of the Sangha after he died. Instead, he gave teachings that the Sangha should govern itself collectively, 
um, by meetings or councils of the elder monks. And so he advised them to have a kind of parliamentary system, which he describes in the Vinaya Pitaka, and it's kind of based on a uh, tribal republic with uh, a council, a, a village, and other elders um, that existed in ancient India. There were some ancient Indian realms that had a kind of um, parliamentary system and um, the Buddha is explicit in basing his constitution or system of governance for the Sangha on that. Some of that uh, kind of survives today apparently among some of the tribal peoples of Pakistan and Afghanistan. But um, so it has a very ancient history though going back to the time of the Buddha. So after the death of the Buddha, um, there were eventually some disagreements among the monks um, about how to believe and how to practice. So when this happened, um, they would meet in councils to try to uh, resolve their disputes. If they couldn't, this would lead to schism or division in the Sangha. And so different sects of Buddhism would form. Um, according to Buddhist tradition, the first Buddhist council was uh, in around 395 BC. So this would have been, this is a modern day, but it's based on the fact that the tradition says it occurred a few years after the Parinirvana of the Buddha. So if the Buddha died around 400 BC, then that would be around 395 BC when this first council took place. And it took place in the city of Rajagaha or Rajgir. So according to the tradition, all the monks gathered, and at this point there was no schism, there was no division in the Sangha. They were all on the same page. They, what they did do is they chanted together all of the teachings that they remembered of the Buddha. So this formed the various sutras and other texts of the Pali Canon. The language Pali was derived from several dialects of Northern Indian languages that were spoken around that time. So it's kind of like a standard vocabulary and uh, uh, syntax that they use to kind of um, synthesize the teachings that could be understood across northern India. They all could kind of agree on and understand. So uh, the second council of Buddhism was at the city of Vaisali, and that happened around 100 years after the Parinirvana, or death of the Buddha. This council was um, called because there was, there was a dispute among the monks about the monastic code, such as whether monks were allowed to accept donations of gold, silver, or other money, rather than of food or the other requisites of a monk, like clothing and so on. Um, they were able to resolve the dispute over donations um, because that was pretty clearly something that was taught by the Buddha, that monks were not supposed to handle money. By the way, because of that teaching, um, a lot of modern Buddhist temples or monasteries will have a lay person on staff to take money donations um, and they will kind of spend it on behalf of the monks. Whereas the monks themselves are only supposed to accept donations of food and clothing and medicine, things like that traditionally. However, um, there were other disputes that could not be resolved after the second council and it eventually led to a split between two main sects of Buddhist monks, the Staviravadins, which basically means the elder traditionalists, and the Mahasangikas, or great uh, Sangha monks. And each of them developed their own Vinaya, or code of conduct. So um, if you look at the history of Buddhist sects, a sect is often identified as an order of monks. And so it's kind of a, a lineage of monks who ordain themselves or ordain their successors. These sects, in other words, are defined mainly by the organizational structure of the Sangha or group of monks, rather than by other doctrines or practices. So formally speaking, a sect of Buddhism like the Staviravadins is not ones that are defined in terms of their belief, but mainly ones defined in terms of the Vinaya or code of conduct followed by the monks. So it's mainly a sect based on the monastic practice and ordination of their successors rather than on doctrine per se. 
So um, kind of connected to that initial split after the second council was another one um, initiated by a monk Mahadeva. So around 35 years after the second council, Mahadeva was arguing for new teachings that the enlightenment of Arhants, those are beings who attain Nirvana by following the teachings of a Buddha. He claimed that a Buddha per se, that is someone who discovers the path to Nirvana and then teaches it to an entire world, the Buddha has a deeper or more profound or more perfect enlightenment than an Arhant. Whereas the earlier understanding of Buddhists was that both Arhants and Buddhas attain Nirvana. So they essentially have the same enlightenment. So um, the Mahadeva's approach to enlightenment, um, the history and exact sequence of this is a little obscure. Um, there's a debate among modern scholars about exactly how this happened, but I would say it's fair, a fair summary that Mahadeva's understanding is more associated with the Mahasangika sect, whereas the Staviravadins had a more traditional view. Um, so this was the beginning of the schisms in Buddhism after the Second Council and after Mahadeva. Eventually, there were eight different sects of Buddhism in ancient India. Most of these no longer exist. Um, the Theravada sect is regarded as the successor or is somehow connected to the Staviravadins. Their name is essentially the same, um, just slightly different versions of uh, pronouncing that. Theravada means teaching of the elders. And this ordination lineage is prominent in South Asian and Southeast Asian Buddhism. You see it in the island of Sri Lanka off the south coast of India and in Southeast Asian languages, uh, Southeast Asian nations like Thailand, Cambodia, and Laos. Uh, the Mahasangikas no longer exist, but they're often compared to and connected by scholars with the later Mahayana movement in um, Buddhism. Technically, Mahayana is not an ordination lineage or a sect in the traditional sense. It's a set of teachings about the nature of enlightenment and of various enlightened beings like Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, but um, it may have grown out of the Mahasangika order, or at least they may have influenced each other in some of their beliefs and practices. So uh, a schism or Sangha Beta, division of the Sangha, is generally caused by a split over monastic rule or Vinaya rather than over doctrine, as I indicated in the previous slide. However, once you get these monastic divisions, they typically developed differences in doctrine as well. An example of that is the Pudgalavada sect of ancient Indian Buddhism. The name of the sect means teaching of the person or Pudgala. They interpreted the Buddha's not self teaching as still being consistent with the existence of a person, Pudgala. This, however, was rejected by most other Buddhists, although there are kind of um, versions of this in some sects of uh, Buddhism today, but it's mainly um, a, a minority or heterodox teaching because there are puzzles in Buddhism about how to understand reincarnation, how to understand nirvana and karma. What being has the karma? What being is reincarnated? what being attains nirvana if there is no person, if there is no self. The Pudgalavada was trying to answer this by saying, no, the Pudgala is real. How to answer this question? There are different answers by different Buddhists, but I do think um, there does seem to be a kind of general view that um, what we call a person, what we call a self, it has a kind of existence, but it's not eternal. It's not permanent. It's always changing. So to understand the way in which it exists, you can't just say it is a substance or a being with its own inherent existence. Rather, it's a being conditioned by karma and constantly changing. Um, uh, another example of a doctrinal dispute is over the nature of the Buddha himself, was uh, whether he was really in a constant state of meditation, for instance, after attaining enlightenment whether he only appeared to teach others because that might require getting out of a state of concentration or absorption. Um, so these doctrinal disputes could happen within 
a sect or monastic ordination lineage as well as between them. For example, in principle, it's possible for a um, Stavirvadin or Theravadin monk to believe some or all of the teachings of the Mahayana movement of Buddhism. Um, indeed, some ancient um, Stavirvadin monks were uh, Mahayanists, uh, as far as I'm aware. That's my understanding. But um, they would still be part of the same sect in the sense of an order of monks that has the same Vinaya, the same code of conduct. Um, and that is in a kind of, uh, you could say, monastic communion with each other. Like they, they meet fortnightly um, and confess their sins to each other, etc. Whereas the monks of different sects would not do that. But monks in the same ordination lineage or monastic sect could still have their own like private beliefs or teachings about the nature of the Dharma, etc. The picture on the slide is of King Ashoka, a very famous and important ancient Indian emperor who at some point converted to Buddhism, became a promoter and follower of Buddhism, and oversaw the Third Council of Buddhism at Vaisali. I mentioned Mahayana Buddhism in some of the previous slides. Mahayana means great vehicle in Sanskrit. Um, it's a movement that started in ancient Indian Buddhism in the first couple of centuries BC, and it had many of its own distinctive beliefs and practices. Today, Mahayana Buddhism is prominent in Central and East Asia. So the modern nations of China, Vietnam, Korea, and Japan, uh, most Buddhists there are Mahayana. Um, and uh, like the rest of Buddhism, Mahayana is no longer practiced that much in India. B Buddhism mostly died out in India around a thousand years ago, about which uh, more later. Unlike Theravada Buddhism, Mahayana is not technically a monastic lineage. Rather, it's a doctrine that developed within various ancient Indian monastic lineages or sects of Buddhism. Mahayana itself is also subdivided into numerous schools of thought, one of which, for example, consciousness only teaches that consciousness is the fundamental reality and physical phenomena only exist as perceptions or other experiences within the awareness of conscious beings. But Mahayana and Theravada are effectively different branches of Buddhism with their own scriptures, practices, and doctrines, even though it is technically possible for a Theravadin to also accept the Mahayana teachings. Generally, they don't. The picture on the slide is of a trinity of Buddhas, Maitreya, Shakyamuni, and Avalokiteshvara. Um, so those are the three figures in the center. It's common for Mahayana Buddhists to worship many Buddhas or enlightened beings and bodhisattvas or other beings that are very advanced on the path to enlightenment, but stay behind in samsara to help teach and give assistance to other conscious beings. Now, um, Theravada Buddhists, they usually worship only Siddhartha Gotama or Shakyamuni Buddha. They will occasionally worship other Buddhas or Bodhisattvas like Maitreya, who Buddhists believe is going to be the next Buddha after our current age ends and the Dharma needs to be retaught and reestablished by another being, that's when Maitreya will appear in our world. But in Mahayana Buddhism, this is one of the things that made them distinct from other Buddhists in ancient India and up to the present day. They worship a large pantheon, you might say, of many Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. So as mentioned, Shakyamuni is another name for Siddhartha Gotama, the founder of Buddhism, who lived in around the 400s BC. Maitreya Buddha is going to be the next Buddha. Technically, he's still a bodhisattva or someone who hasn't attained full nirvana, full enlightenment. Um, this is connected to the Buddhist view that once a being attains nirvana, they will no longer incarnate in samsara or in conditioned reality. Um, after the death of their last body, they attain pari nirvana and so don't come back. But Maitreya, even though he's technically just an advanced bodhisattva, he will uh, be soon reborn as a Buddha. And so he's often just called Maitreya Buddha. You'll notice the two figures on the left, to the left of Shakyamuni Buddha, in that sculpture. They're dressed a bit differently 
from the Shakyamuni Buddha in the center. Shakyamuni Buddha is dressed as a monk in robes. Whereas the figures on his left and right, they actually are wearing a necklace and other jewelry. They're dressed as princes or kings. And this is an um, iconographic or stylistic way of showing that they're not actually full Buddhas yet. They're not living as monks, which you must do to be a Buddha. Um, so they're depicted as kings or princes to show that they will soon incarnate or at some future point they will incarnate as a monk and as a Buddha. Um, Maitreya is, um, like I said, regarded as the future Buddha or the next Buddha of our world just in the next age. Whereas Avalokiteshvara, shown on the right, is another bodhisattva or being on the precipice of attaining nirvana. But Avalokiteshvara is especially associated with compassion. So he's one of the main um, bodhisattvas worshipped by Mahayana Buddhists. Um, and it shows the kind of ideal of why you would want to become a bodhisattva in the first place out of compassion for other beings. So instead of going to nirvana straight away and transcending samsara, you kind of deliberately stay behind and try to teach other beings to get on the path. So eventually they can attain nirvana as well. So Mahayana Buddhism, one of the most distinct things about it from Theravada is that it teaches the bodhisattva path. This is the path of becoming a Buddha, a full scale Buddha, not just an arhant in a future life. And you do this out of compassion for the suffering of other beings. An arhant is still someone who's enlightened, just like a Buddha, but they attained enlightenment or Bodhi after following the Dharma, the teaching of a Buddha. And it may take them a while to do this, but they don't. The difference between an arhat and a Buddha, uh, even though they both attain enlightenment, the Buddha is the one who's discovering the path to enlightenment and teaching that path, that dharma, to a whole world or universe of other beings. So, in the Mahayana understanding, to become a Buddha is a much more significant act than to become an arhat. Arhats can still teach other beings about the Dharma and help, in a sense, assist them on the path to Nirvana. But that ends once they attain Bodhi or Nirvana, once they attain enlightenment, because they no longer will incarnate in samsara. Whereas a Bodhisattva, even though they are quite enlightened, they're not yet fully enlightened. They've not yet attained full Nirvana. So they can deliberately even um, delay attaining Nirvana so that they can be reborn strategically, you might say, in samsara to help other beings. And then eventually they will become a Buddha when they're reborn in a time and in a place when the Dharma has been lost, forgotten, or misunderstood. And by reestablishing the Dharma there, they will help countless other beings, millions, billions, or more, eventually attain Nirvana. So a Bodhisattva is a being who's on the Bodhisattva path and who's an advanced practitioner, you might say, someone who's quite close to becoming a full-fledged Buddha in a future incarnation. And according to Mahayana, the compassion and the other virtues of a Buddha are actually more perfect, more developed than that of an Arhant. The Buddha will even generally have additional supernatural or miraculous powers, siddhis, that help them uh, teach the Dharma to other beings. So the Mahayana Sutras are scriptures of Mahayana Buddhism. And historically speaking, these date to several centuries after the life of the Buddha. So probably the earliest ones are from the first couple of centuries BC, and they continued to be authored for many centuries after that. Um, but the Mahayana understanding of this is that they claim uh, many of the Mahayana Sutras were written or authored by the Buddha or by his um, inner circle of disciples. But um, they claim that the teachings uh, were hidden by the Buddha and his followers by being given to Nagas or earth spirits in the form of serpents who took them below the surface of the earth and retained them as kind of treasures or precious gifts that would only be revealed in later times when they would be understood by later followers of the Buddha. And then some monks in later centuries, they would basically be given 
these uh, sutras, these scriptures and other teachings by Nagas, or they'd be revealed through visions and things um, kind of mystically. So that's the Mahayana explanation of why the sutras are not a part of the Pali Canon or the other older collections of Buddhist teachings, but they start to be introduced in um, the first couple of centuries BC and AD. So I mentioned Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, a bit more about these different types of beings. Now, I mentioned that there's a traditional view in Buddhism that once you attain Nirvana, uh, especially after Parinirvana, after the death of your last body, um, a being, whether a Buddha or Arhant, will not come back to samsara. They've transcended samsara or conditioned reality. So their consciousness is totally pure, totally awake, totally aware. Um, they, they have no further contact with samsara. But that would mean that, for example, Siddhartha Gautama, um, after his parinirvana, you cannot interact with him if you are still in samsara. You can't pray to the Buddha and have your prayer answered. He might be aware of your prayer in some sense, but he's not going to dirty himself, so to speak, by by extending part of his being or awareness back into samsara after his parin nirvana. That that is still kind of the view, at least officially, um, in Theravada Buddhism, uh, which for the most part is you know not Mahayanist. Um, although they still do pray to the Buddha and expect a response, but the official way of how they reconcile that is that it's actually the faith, the uh, compassion, the wisdom of the believer in prayer that creates the good karma. So it's kind of like mediated by the prayer to the Buddha, but they're kind of uplifting themselves through their own uh, good karma, their own purity, their own awareness, etc. But the Mahayana view of that is different. They actually think that even after attaining Parinirvana, a Buddha can still interact with samsara. And they interpret Buddhas as even more being godlike beings, um, I guess I would say, than in Theravada. Now, keep in mind, in Theravada Buddhism, um, they still believe that Buddhas and Arhans have miraculous powers. So you could even compare... Um, the view of enlightened beings in Theravada and Mahayana to gods or powerful spirits or other beings in other religions because they can perform miracles, um, essentially. There's even a list, long list of the various miraculous powers of enlightened beings in the Pali Canon. However, they have even larger scale powers, um, particularly the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas in Mahayana Buddhism. Buddhas can even create whole worlds or universes that are called pure lands or Buddha realms. And they create these so that other beings can pray to them to be reborn in these realms. And the Buddhas can manifest there and teach the Dharma. Um, so it's just a way of, of helping out other uh, beings more by creating whole universes where other beings can then interact with the Buddha directly and, and hear their teachings hear their dharma, and thus understand them better, to make it easier for them to attain nirvana eventually. So there are many, many Buddhas and bodhisattvas worshipped in Mahayana Buddhism. Some of the main examples include Amitabha. He's the main Buddha of the pure land um, that's worshipped by Mahayana Buddhists. So they will pray to Amitabha Buddha to allow them to be reborn there. So they're not directly praying for enlightenment, but if they're reborn into this Buddha realm and they can hear the Dharma from Amitabha, then they'll be able to attain Nirvana, um, partly through their own efforts, partly through their own understanding, after rebirth in the Pure Land. Another example of a Bodhisattva mentioned before on the previous slide, Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva of compassion. And compassion is important for all Buddhists but um, is emphasized a lot in Mahayana Buddhism because of its connection to the Bodhisattva path, that these are beings who kind of deliberately uh, delay their own full enlightenment. Um, they deliberately remain in samsara because they don't only want to save themselves, they want to save as many other beings as possible before they cross over completely to the other side. Another important Buddha is Manjushri, the Buddha of wisdom or deep understanding of the Buddha's Dharma. 
One of the very important figures in the history of Buddhism is Ashoka the Great. Uh, he was flourishing around 273 BC. That's roughly when he um, came to power as king. He was one of the kings of the Mauryan dynasty. And um, he was, I believe, the grandson of the founder of the dynasty, Chandragupta Maurya. Um, and Ashoka, um, he's mentioned in um, ancient inscriptions. Um, his inscriptions are some of the first in ancient India. They provide a lot of uh, our knowledge uh, of ancient Indian history from this period. So um, before this, there was literature and there were texts, but there wasn't much writing in India. They didn't write things down, at least not after the um, end of the Indus Valley civilization, so uh, which ended around uh, 1500 BC or so. Um, so they just had oral transmission of texts, and a lot of that information was just lost, although some of it is preserved in the Veda of Hinduism. But yeah, Ashoka the Great, he erected um, pillars with inscriptions and had other inscriptions done on stone and walls of caves and cliffs all around India, all around his empire. So um, the significance of the Mauryan dynasty is that they united all of the Aryan kingdoms of northern India. So the Aryans were an ancient people. Um, their religion, their scriptures, the Veda, became the basis for Hinduism. Uh, but they were politically divided in the earlier part of their history. Um, they had several different kingdoms all over northern India, mainly along the Ganges uh, River Valley and part of the uh, Indus River Valley. And um, the Mauryans were the first to conquer all these and make them into one giant uh, empire. Um, and Ashoka the Great extended the territory of the empire greatly by conquering most of southern India. This was called the Kalinga War, that war of conquest, and involved killing many, many thousands of people. The traditional story told by Buddhists is that after this, Ashoka the Great had a kind of change of heart. He felt sorry for all of the death and destruction he had caused, and he started to promote Buddhism. Uh, with, uh, and He basically became a, a convert to Buddhism and adopted the Buddhist principle of ahimsa or nonviolence and tried to rule with as little violence and force and oppression as possible. He had toleration of other religions though and promoted, gave support to the religions of many different sects. Um, however, it's regarded by Buddhists that he was especially a follower of Buddhism and he built uh, stupas or mounds for relics and Buddhist temples uh, across India. He sent missions of Buddhist monks to spread the Dharma throughout his empire and even beyond. And he also presided over the third Buddhist council at Vaisali. According to the tradition of Sri Lanka, um, Ashoka's son Mahinda was a Buddhist monk who led a mission, a Buddhist mission to the island of Sri Lanka around 225 BC. We do know that around this time, um, Theravada Buddhism was brought to Sri Lanka and Sri Lanka became the main center of Theravada Buddhism for much of the rest of Buddhist history. Um, you can see on the map some of the uh, missions uh, of Buddhism during the reign of Ashoka the Great. And this is also when Buddhism spread outside of India to some other parts of Asia. So a bit more now about the spread of Buddhism. Um, this map kind of shows the territorial extent of Buddhism in Asia at its height. Not all of the areas on the map are still Buddhists. Uh, the ones that aren't, they have largely converted to Islam or um, some other religions, or like in parts of China, uh, most people are atheists or just don't practice religions. So around 100 BC, this is when Mahayana originates in India, uh, probably in the north. Um, although it could have been in another part of India as well. And pretty soon Mahayana, which originates mainly among the monks, it's some of the monks who have this idea of not just trying to become an Arhant, but becoming a full Buddha yourself as being like a, a fuller um, or better way of following the teaching of the Buddha. Um, but it quickly spreads into a larger cultural movement that has both monks and lay people as devotees. And it begins to spread across other parts of India or South Asia. 
um, you can see the lines of transmission of the main divisions of Buddhism. Mahayana in the red arrows. Um, green is the Theravada Buddhism. Um, and then we have blue for Vajrayana. Vajrayana, we'll talk about that more in a moment, but this is basically a, a type of Mahayana Buddhism, arguably, or a subdivision of it that has some of its own distinctive um, beliefs and practices. It's also called uh, Tantric Buddhism. So um, around 50 BC is when Mahayana Buddhism and other types of Buddhism too um, enters China. And it does so by the Silk Road. So um, the Silk Road is an ancient trade route that runs uh, from east to west, east to China, and west uh, basically to parts of the Middle East. And it runs mainly through Central Asia. Um, so this was a very important trade route. The eastern end or half of it was largely controlled by China. Um, and it's called the Silk Road because one of the most valuable commodities that was traded was silk, which was only produced in China. So it was very valued by people in other parts of Asia, the Middle East and Europe, but uh, they could only be sourced from China. But there were other goods traded along the Silk Road as well. Um, and so because this is a route of travel that has um, merchants going along it in caravans and there's um, caravan sarais or kind of like inns and depots for the merchants to stay in along the way, it becomes a way for Buddhist monks to conveniently travel back and forth across Asia. And so it's one of the main ways that Buddhism spread both through Central Asia where the Silk Road ran, but also into China and other parts to the East uh, in Eastern Asia. So even though Buddhism comes to China in 50 BC, it takes several centuries before it spreads and becomes a religion of the majority, which it eventually did. So um, it was after, uh, by the, the first couple of centuries AD, that Buddhism became really widespread throughout China. Around 372 AD, Buddhism um, spread to Korea from China. Um, and around 552 AD, Buddhism spread to Japan, uh, largely from Korea. Around 500 AD, that was when uh, Vajrayana or Tantra Buddhism originates. And this is in India. It's around the same time as Tantric Hinduism. So the Tantra, their basic idea is they offer special techniques, uh, practices, rituals that will, um, and types of meditation that will give you a more instantaneous or direct path to enlightenment. Because you see this teaching um, in Buddhism that enlightenment can be very difficult, maybe even impossible for most beings to reach. Um, because of how deluded we are, of how much ignorance we have, uh, of how much we're mired in suffering and samsara. And so the Tantra offers a special secret techniques and teachings that offers a more direct route. And that's similar to the function it plays in Hinduism, but they just have a different theology in Hinduism and a different uh, soteriology or theory of salvation. Um, but um, that, that's why there's both Tantric Buddhism and Hinduism, because they do have some things in common. And they probably kind of emerge out of the same uh, cultural movement in uh, northern India around that time. So in 630 AD, that's around when Buddhism spreads to Tibet from India. Even though Tibet is closer to India than China was, um, Buddhism spread to China earlier because of the ease of travel along the Silk Road. Whereas Tibet is separated from India via the Himalayan mountains, and Tibet itself is um, largely consisting of mountains and a very high elevation, rocky plateaus. So it's difficult to travel there, um, and it's just more remote. So that was one of the reasons why it took longer for Buddhism to spread to Tibet. But Tibet uh, quickly became mostly um, Tantric or Vajrayana Buddhist and even help spread some varieties of Vajrayana to other parts of Central Asia, like Mongolia. Uh, in the 7th century AD and after, Theravada and Mahayana Buddhism spread to Southeast Asia. And you can see some of the lines of transmission there, both from Sri Lanka and from other parts of India. Um, and in the 12th century AD and after, Buddhism mostly declined in India itself. By then, um, there were several factors contributing to it, but the largest thing that happened in the 12th century was 
invasion of Muslim armies that destroyed the remaining Buddhist monasteries and schools. You can see also on the map um, Buddhism in various islands of Indonesia, such as um, Sumatra and Java and parts of Borneo um, and even parts of the Philippines. Um, those areas are no longer Buddhist, but mainly Muslim. So uh, later on, um, Buddhism was largely replaced by Islam there. Similar things happened in other parts of um, Central and Southwestern Asia. So what's now Pakistan, Afghanistan, and parts of the Central Asian republics, like parts of Kazakhstan, were largely Buddhist um, in antiquity. But later on, um, the Turkish tribes and others brought Islam there. So those areas are now no longer um, Buddhist, but primarily Muslim, as well as, for example, the province of Xinjiang in uh, Western China, although Mongolia and Tibet still practice uh, Vajrayana Buddhism. So a bit more now about East Asian Buddhism. When we say East Asian Buddhism, this largely means Chinese Buddhism and the Buddhism of other countries that were influenced by the Chinese schools and sects of Buddhism. These would include Vietnam, Korea, and Japan. So Mahayana Buddhism became much more prominent in Eastern Asia than it was in Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia is mostly Theravada Buddhist. East Asia, like China and those other countries I mentioned, they're primarily Mahayana, although there was historically some uh, Hinayana uh, Buddhism and also Vajrayana. So we can basically use these terms Theravada and Mahayana as a kind of dichotomy, even though it's technically possible for a Theravada Buddhist to practice the Bodhisattva path, i.e. Mahayana, and some do, the majority do not. So um, equating Theravada with Hinayana or the lesser vehicle, which is how Mahayana refers to um, non-Mahayana Buddhists, this is mostly an accurate um, equation, even though it's not strictly speaking correct. This is a picture, by the way, of uh, Chinese Buddhists practicing ancestor veneration at a Buddhist temple. Um, so one of the aspects of Chinese and other East Asian Buddhism is that it sometimes incorporates um, non-Buddhist customs like the veneration of your family's ancestors. Um, this is something that actually Buddhism in general has. It's a sort of inclusivist religion and in that it can be combined sometimes with the beliefs and practices of other religions. So another example of this is in Southeast Asia, in Thailand, um, Theravada Buddhists there will sometimes also worship the spirits of trees or other nature spirits. So they will combine Thai animism with Theravada Buddhism. Uh, so one variety of Buddhism that developed in China um, is called the Chan or meditation school of Buddhism. Now Chan Buddhists trace their school of Buddhism back to India. They think that it was founded in China by Bodhidharma, but that he got the teaching from other Buddhists and that it ultimately went back to the Buddha himself. But it was this special wordless teaching that the Buddha illustrated to one of his followers just by lifting a lotus flower, a symbol of enlightenment, wordlessly. So there's this teaching of Chan that you can't describe the Dharma most fully using words. You have to experience it in the reality, the truth of your own mind that you develop through meditation. So um, there's a direct nonverbal intuitive insight into the nature of Bodhi or enlightenment, which they transmit through their special lineage. Historically speaking, Chan probably developed in China itself in the first millennium AD. And then when it was brought to uh, Japan, it became, uh, centuries later, it became known as Zen. Zen is basically just the Japanese way of pronouncing Chan. Chan, by the way, is itself not originally a Chinese word. It's the Chinese way of pronouncing uh, Dhyana or Jhana, which is a state of absorption you can attain through meditation practice. One of the distinctive things about the Chan school in China and other countries is that it puts much more emphasis on meditation practice, both by monks and by lay people, 
than other schools of Mahayana Buddhism, which may emphasize other rituals like uh, mantras or prayers reciting the name of Amitabha Buddha for the sake of being reborn in the Pure Land. That is the main practice of Pure Land Buddhism. So other distinctive uh, teachings and practices of Chan or Zen Buddhism include their one of their uh, methods or styles of meditation, which is called Chiguan Datsuo in Chinese or Shikantaza in Japanese. This means just sitting meditation. So it's a meditation where you don't have a explicit theme or subject of concentration, which might be something like the breath or an object of visualization or a quality of the Buddha in other types of Buddhism. But uh, in Chan and Zen, they uh, practice this uh, just sitting or themeless meditation where you, in a sense, perhaps just focus on your own mind, your own consciousness, rather than trying to pick out some aspect of phenomena or um, concept idea that you might focus on instead. Um, the Chan teaching of Buddha nature is also distinctive, at least from some other forms of Buddhism. Um, they believe that the nature of beings, sentient beings, conscious beings, is inherently or already pure and enlightened. So um, it's not that you have to make yourself enlightened through purification. You have to discover and understand and be aware of the enlightenment or purity that already exists there. Some of these teachings, by the way, are probably influenced by the Chinese religion of Taoism, which uh, even before Buddhism entered China, had a system of meditation that was uh, similar to this just sitting meditation. And also in Taoism, they tend to talk about the original nature of things as being uh, pure or at peace or at harmony with the Tao or way of things, etc. Another distinctive Chan or Zen teaching is sudden enlightenment. So they believe that because of Buddha nature already being there in the mind, you can have a spontaneous or instantaneous aha moment where you have a sudden insight into the nature of enlightenment. Um, although they generally think that you have to practice meditation for many years, practically speaking, in order to attain one of these um, sudden insights. And because of this idea that there can be like a breakthrough of the mind quite suddenly to attain meditation, there are often um, practices of Chan or Zen that involve shocking the mind out of its complacency or delusion. Um, this can also be connected to a practice of some Chan and Zen Buddhists of having a monk going around with a stick and whacking people on the back while they're meditating. Um, another aspect of this is meditation on gong on, koan in Japanese, which are literally uh, case records or precedents in the ancient China, they would use this to refer to legal precedents that could be used by later jurists to come to interpretations of the law. But in Chan, they refer to old stories or narratives uh, of a teaching of a Chan master to a student uh, or junior monk who had to learn more about enlightenment. And the idea is these old stories of a kind of um, dialogue or aha moment of a Chan student, they can be used by Chan meditators today to try to further their own enlightenment. But they tend to be puzzles or paradoxes that you can't understand or solve with your rational mind. You have to kind of see through to the end intuitively. There's also a strong, tra a strong tradition, um, especially in Japanese Zen, of combining Buddhist meditation and other practices with practice of various arts. So Zen masters will often express their insight or enlightenment through poems, painting, calligraphy, etc. The picture on the slide is of the Chan master Bodhidharma, who's the founder of Chan Buddhism in China, according to Chan and Zen. And um, he was Indian, um, an, uh, by ethnicity uh, and from his uh, homeland. And so that's also why he's often depicted as having large eyes and a thick bushy beard. From the perspective of Chinese and Japanese Buddhists, Indians look different. And so um, he's often portrayed in that kind of um, stereotyped way, just so you can tell. 
Bodhidharma apart from the other figures. But here he is meditating facing the wall of the cave. And there's also a type of Chan meditation called wall contemplation, where you sit facing a wall. And there's different interpretations of what this is or what the meaning is. But um, sometimes this can be just regarded as a way of coming uh, face to face with your own nature because you're basically focusing on nothing. You're looking at a wall, but it's connected to the idea of the themeless meditation or confronting directly your own mind. And also it's a way of avoiding distractions and things like that. Or sometimes it's interpreted as making your mind like the wall, i.e. not having any specific features uh, to it that have meaning. So just kind of like a blank, but also an empty with potential uh, mind. There's lots of layers of interpretation you could add to it. But the picture on the slide is of the younger or junior Buddhist monk, Hui Ke, going to Bodhidharma asking to become a student. And there's a Chan story told about this that Hui Ge couldn't get Bodhidharma's attention at first because Bodhidharma was so fixed on his meditation facing the wall of the cave he went to to try to avoid distractions. And uh, Hui Ke asked uh, twice for Bodhidharma to accept him as a student, but Bodhidharma just ignored him. So the third time he actually cut off his hand in order to show how committed he was to meditating and becoming an enlightened master and attaining nirvana. And then after that third time he requested after cutting off his hand, then Bodhidharma let him be a student. So um, historically speaking, this probably didn't happen. Um, I'm getting this from the scholar of the history of Zen Buddhism, John McRae, but he's written books about the history of Zen and Chan. And he says that Hui Ke did lose his arm, but it was after being chopped off by a bandit. So then why would this version of the story have entered into Chan and Zen Buddhism? Well, it's because it illustrates the idea of the discipline and dedication you need in order to master the meditation and other practices of Chan. That you have to kind of devote your whole life and everything in order to uh, be acceptable as a student and thus to be able to attain enlightenment potentially. Shinran Buddhism is a type of Buddhism that originated in Japan. Um, Shinran was the founder. He lived between 1173 and 1263 AD. He was a Japanese Buddhist monk. So he advocated devotion to Amida Buddha, which is the Japanese name of Amitabha. There were other sects of Pure Land Buddhism, so-called, in China and other parts of East Asia before this, including Japan, that had a similar practice of worshiping Amitabha Buddha by reciting his name in a prayer or mantra. And they'd often do this hundreds or thousands of times, counting off each recitation with a bead in a mala or um, necklace uh, of prayer beads. So uh, Shinran took that practice though even further and said that the only way to attain enlightenment or salvation in samsara is through the grace, the saving other power, Tariki in Japanese, of Amida Buddha. So that we are too deluded, we are too ignorant, we cannot save ourselves through our own effort or self-power, Jiriki in Japanese. This is a different teaching from that of the Zen school of Japanese Buddhism because it focuses on using your own power, your own effort through your meditation to gain the wisdom of a Buddha. But Shinran is in some ways the opposite of that because it focuses on Jiriki or sorry, focuses on Tariki or the grace of the Buddha. So Shinran, um, even the teachings about uh, Tariki and Jiriki you find in um, other pure land uh, Buddhists in Japan and China. But Shinran took that even further because by his reasoning, if it's the grace of the Buddha that enables you to attain enlightenment and be saved from samsara, then that grace can operate miraculously even if you're not a monk, even if you don't meditate. So he argued that becoming a monk, meditating and performing other Buddhist practices practices could be an irrelevant distraction and something you might be attached to. So the only thing you can do is pray to the Buddha and hope for his um, salvific grace. So I mentioned earlier Tantric Buddhism and Vajrayana. 
Tantra is named after a type of text or scripture called the Tantras. These were attributed to the Buddha, but they were actually authored more than a thousand years after his death in the 7th century AD and after. These texts have common themes similar to those of the Hindu Tantras from the same period, claiming that mantras and other special rituals could be used to attain enlightenment more directly, quickly, and surely. So these tantric teachings were generally kept secret and they could only be learned, at least in their fullness, from a special guru. Uh, and that would only be taught to uh, people who had undergone secret initiations. So this is the type of esoteric religion or sect that has secret teachings only revealed to those who are authorized, i.e. those who've gone through the initiation ceremonies. So Buddhist monks and nuns would use mantras, these are short prayers or chants, and other rituals to give healing, fertility, and other boons or blessings to lay people. So this is done, I guess it's fair to say, um, in Buddhism generally, but it's an especially big part of Tantric Buddhism, also called Vajrayana. Vajrayana means the um, Vajra vehicle. Vajra is the mystic thunderbolt of the god Indra. Indra is a Hindu god, but uh, some of the Hindu gods, mainly some of the ones of the Veda, like Indra and Brahma, they are worshipped in Buddhism because they can be regarded as protectors or defenders of the Buddha or of his Dharma. So the Vajra or thunderbolt of Indra is a symbol for the spiritual power you can gain through these various tantric practices. So what are some of the other distinctive practices of Vajrayana? I already mentioned mantras. These are used by Buddhists generally, but there are secret or esoteric mantras in Vajrayana Buddhism that are believed to have special spiritual power. Another distinctively Vajrayana practice is that of mandalas, sacred circles or diagrams that are usually bilaterally uh, symmetrical. That can also be symbolic of the cosmos and the various Buddhas associated with the directions of north, south, east, west, up, down, and center. Um, so the significance of this is praying to the Buddhas of the four directions, etc., and kind of being able to gain their assistance, gain their power. As well, mandalas are used as objects of visualization in meditation. A lot of the Vajrayana meditation techniques involve elaborate visualizations that are believed to have a special spiritual power. There are also mudras. These are sacred gestures that have a power or significance. Again, mudras are used in Buddhism generally. It's a part of Buddhist iconography. For example, the Buddha or other people to have certain gestures when they're teaching, when they're meditating, etc. The dhyana or meditation mudra, for example, is used in Zen Buddhism and many other Buddhists when they meditate. Um, however, uh, in Tantric Buddhism, they have secret mudras that they use that are believed to have special powers. So there's a general concept in Indian religions of siddhas. These are beings who have miraculous power or siddhi. But the emphasis on the siddhas is very prominent in Vajrayana or Tantric Buddhism. So there's a belief that there's a lot of beings, including ones historically, but also ones still out there today that have miraculous powers they've obtained through practicing Vajrayana. Another distinctively Vajrayana practice is called deity yoga. Yoga in this sense meaning meditation, deity meaning a god. So uh, the idea is you can do a meditation where you visualize a god or some other spiritually powerful being like a Buddha or Bodhisattva. The reason why um, Buddhists would do this with gods is because some gods and goddesses can either themselves be Buddhas or Bodhisattvas, um, or they can be protectors um, of the Buddhas or their Dharma. So they have a religious significance within Buddhism. And in deity yoga, you visualize this um, sacred being, but you also may adopt their asana or posture, their mudra or gesture, 
and other aspects of them, including of their mind or spiritual state. So you're trying to become this deity, the sacred being, to embody their virtues. And this is one of the reasons why Vajrayana Buddhists believe their practices give you a more direct and swift approach to enlightenment, in part because you're kind of gaining vicariously or by proxy or along the model of all of these um, attributes of these divine beings who are already much more spiritually advanced on the path. So Vajrayana, as mentioned, uh, can be translated as thunderbolt vehicle, also can be translated as diamond vehicle because Vajra can mean both a diamond or a thunderbolt in Sanskrit. And you might wonder what's the connection there. Well, a diamond flashes with light, just like a thunderbolt does. It's also very strong and powerful, like a thunderbolt. Um, and this is distinct from Hinayana. Its relation to Mahayana Buddhism is that it's uh, incorporating most of the ideas, if not all of them, from Mahayana, like the Bodhisattva path, for example, like emptiness and some other aspects of Mahayana philosophy and doctrine. And so some scholars regard Vajrayana as a part or a sub-branch of Mahayana Buddhism. So uh, Tantric Buddhism is associated with various taboo practices like Tantric sex. Not all uh, Vajrayana Buddhists, though, practice the taboo practices. So there's a distinct distinction between so-called right-handed or um, Dakshina and left-handed Tantra. Right-handed Tantra does not use the taboo practices. It uses all the ones we previously mentioned, including uh, mantras, mandalas, mudra, uh, mandalas, mudras, etc. The left-handed uh, Tantra does use the taboo or antinomian practices. Antinomian means going against the laws or customs of a people. So these include uh, ritual sex or tantric sex, handling skulls uh, or other mortal remains of humans and other things too. Now, not all tantric Buddhists will condone or practice left-handed Tantra, but these are the ones that are kind of most infamous and thus paradoxically most well-known or most associated with Tantric Buddhism, even though they're not quite as commonly practiced as the other parts are. So um, why would Tantric Buddhists do this? Why would they handle mortal remains like skulls? Why would they have people, including monks, who have vows of chastity engaging in ritual sex? Well, um, the common thread here, there's kind of like a different, I guess, reason or, or justification or interpretation of each of these taboo practices. But the common theme is they're trying to use passion or other unenlightened states of being and convert them to the path towards nirvana. So they're trying to leverage our worldly unenlightened passions and states of being and use them to energize, activate, and accelerate the path towards enlightenment. Um, and this is kind of like the common thread of, of Tantra generally, and partly why they believe they have a surer and a swifter and more direct path to nirvana than other forms of Buddhism, because they're leveraging our very unenlightened state of being and making it part of the path to enlightenment. So one example of this um, is um, what happens in um, ritual sex, uh, which is called karma mudra, uh, literally the, the mudra or gesture of action. So um, there are three main phases of this. First, um, the people engaged in the ritual sex act will visualize male and female deities in sexual union called Yabyum, which you can see in the pictures on the slides. Um, Mahasiddhas are the great siddhas or the beings with miraculous powers. And they will have a consort of the opposite sex to them through which they can perform this union. Um, now, the second stage of this practice is creating heat or passion, which can be called tumo in um, Tantric Buddhism 
through the manipulation of prana or vital energy. Prana literally means breath in Sanskrit, but it can also be used to refer to various types of mental and physical energy that circulate in the mind and the body. And um, you see this general idea in Tantric Hinduism too, where they try to rouse certain types of prana or vital energy and then channel it towards enlightenment. So the idea is you're visualizing this sexual act, you might be creating lust or other types of vital energy that you're arousing, but then you have to perform ritual and meditation to channel that vital energy towards um, an enlightened end. So um, the third kind of stage of this uh, tantric sex is the karma mudra itself. And so it's a ritual that can only be performed by a man and a woman who are sufficiently advanced in their meditation. So you actually engage in sexual embrace um, to arouse lust or passion, but you're not allowed to um, have orgasm or climax. The purpose of this is just to arouse the lust or passion, but then to perform rituals and meditation techniques that divert that lust towards another end, the great bliss or mahasuka that is of enlightenment. And it's believed that when you arouse this energy and channel it towards that end, you're able to more rapidly uh, transform your mind in a type of spiritual alchemy to make it more enlightened. You're basically harnessing and leveraging the fact that you have all this lust and impure passion and then uh, through the ritual, through the meditation, uh, channeling that towards a more pure form of consciousness. And that's why you're not allowed to um, have um, orgasm or culmination because then that would dissipate the energy and not allow it to be transformed into this more spiritual form. Now, most even uh, left-hand tantric Buddhists who use um, the idea of tantric sex, they don't actually practice literal sex. Rather, they will use um, the yabyum as an object of meditation, uh, a visualization for their meditation. And not only might this um, enable them to rouse their passion and thus transmute it, but also there are various um, spiritual significances to the, the sexual embrace of the tantric couple. Um, of the Mahasiddhas and their consorts because it emphasizes the male and female sides of enlightenment. For Tantric Buddhism, they think of the male side of enlightenment as involving compassion and the female side as involving wisdom. Um, and so when you have the two sides of enlightenment going together, you're um, developing your wisdom, you're developing your compassion at the same time. Section 6.2 scriptures will look at the Pali Canon and various other scriptures used by Buddhists. Originally, the Buddha's Dharma or teaching was transmitted orally, and this went on for several centuries. The monks memorized the various discourses of the Buddha word for word and uh, just chanted it together. Uh, and then passed it on to the next generation of monks that way. This is similar to how Hindus trans, transmitted the Veda purely orally for many centuries before it was ever written down. According to Buddhist tradition, the entire Pali Canon, all of the teachings of the Buddha and his um, early disciples, were recited by the monks at the first council at Vaishali. Um, certain monks would specialize in memorizing and reciting parts of the Pali Canon, canon because it's a really huge text. Um, it would be far too much for one person to memorize. Even the amounts that are memorized by one monk can be tens of thousands of verses, but they don't generally memorize the whole thing. So it wasn't written down until the first century BC on the island of Sri Lanka. And the reason why they wrote it down is because Buddhism there and elsewhere in India had undergone a period of disruption that created a bottleneck in the number of monks who knew and could recite the scriptures. So there was a real risk that parts of the scriptures would be lost for all time if certain monks died without transmitting their knowledge to the next generation. 
So they wrote it down so that the Dharma might last for a long time, as they put it. This uh, problem was actually faced by Jainism uh, and around the same period too. But um, the Jains were not able to get um, most of their scriptures down in writing um, until a lot of it had just been lost. Um, so a lot of the Jain scriptures, even though they reflect earlier teachings, they were actually later compositions from later centuries, much after the time of the founding of religion by uh, Jina Mahavira. Um, so historically speaking, some of the Pali Canon probably does go back to the Buddha and his first generation of disciples, um, but other parts were probably added later by later generations of Buddhists up to several centuries after the life of the Buddha. The Pali Canon is divided into three parts, collectively known as the Tipitaka or Triple Basket. Uh, Pitaka is Pali for basket and Ti means three. The three parts are the Sutta Pitaka, Vinaya Pitaka, and Abhidhamma Pitaka. The uh, words in parentheses are the Sanskrit versions of these terms. So Sutta is Pali for Sutra. We're more familiar in English with the Sanskrit version. Sutta and Sutra mean thread. So the idea is there's a single thread going through each of the treatises or discourses or talks given by the Buddha. Um, sutra is actually related to the English word suture, which is a thread that you use to bind a wound. So that might help you remember the meaning of sutta or sutra. Vinaya means discipline. So this is the collection that has the Buddhist, Buddhist teachings on monastic rules, the code of conduct, uh, followed by monks and nuns. Abhidhamma means higher or further teaching. Um, and so it's a later uh, collection of treatises on metaphysics, psychology, and other philosophy based on the Buddhist teachings, but it's generally agreed by scholars they were actually composed after the time of the Buddha. And each uh, Pitaka has many subdivisions of its own. They contain um, hundreds of separate texts each. You can see in the picture on the right a complete modern printed edition of the Pali Canon by the Pali Text Society. And it goes to dozens of volumes that fulfill that fills an entire bookcase. So it's much more than one volume's worth of material. So for example, the Sutra Pitaka has five main Nikayas or collections, each of which has dozens or over a hundred uh, sutras. The canon was closed or ended um, after the death of the Buddha. The Sutra Pitaka canon, probably the latest text of that, at least in the Pali version, was around 150 years after the death of the Buddha. The Vinaya and the Abhidhamma Pitakas were closed later, especially the Abhidhamma was authored several centuries after the death of the Buddha. There are also um, texts that are not officially part of the canon, but some of which are still very important for Buddhist monks and sometimes lay people as well. An example of that is the Pratimoksha or the monastic code of conduct. It's derived from the stories and teachings of the Vinaya Pitaka, but it's kind of like a um, edited recension of the actual rules themselves that monks are supposed to follow. In the Vinaya, you get not only the rule, but the story um, surrounding the Buddha's life that caused him to invent or add this rule to the code of conduct. Usually each rule when it's added, it's because the Sangha was facing some problem of discipline. And so the Buddha had to invent a new rule in order to deal with the problem. Well, the Prati Moksha doesn't give that historical context of the rule. It just gives the rules themselves and kind of edits them together. This is not technically part of the Pali Canon, even though it's used by many um, monks. It's a very important text. I'm using the phrase Pali Canon, but do keep in mind that in ancient times, there were other versions of these same scripture, scriptures in Sanskrit and other languages um, like Chinese and Tibetan. But the Pali Canon is the only um, version 
of those original scriptures that survives intact. But a lot of these um, teachings are also used by other Buddhists, um, not just Theravada Buddhists who mainly use the Pali Canon. So I mentioned Pali. This is a term used for the language in which the oldest complete collections of the Buddhist scriptures was recorded. Pali was not actually a language spoken by the Buddha or anyone else at his time. That's a somewhat misleading, albeit accurate way of putting it. It's a standardized dialect, a hybrid of the various other dialects or Prakrits spoken across Northern India around the time of the Buddha, all of which derived from Sanskrit. In other words, the Buddha spoke something very similar to Pali, but we can tell through the linguistic evidence that this is a standardized or hybrid version created to make it comprehensible to um, people throughout ancient North India. Um, Pali, the Pali Canon was preserved by Theravada Buddhists, which is the only surviving ancient sect of Buddhism. The picture on the right is of a much later manuscript form of the Pali Canon. Traditional Buddhist manuscripts in um, South, Southeast Asia and other parts of Asia, many of them were done on palm leaf uh, paper, which has that elongated form. And they're actually um, collected in these, um, they're like bound together and they have wooden covers, um, but each page is going to be very stretched out and long. But there were versions of the ancient Buddhist canon in Sanskrit and other languages in ancient India. The complete Sanskrit version of the original scriptures has been lost. There are survivals of parts of it in Sanskrit. Um, even though these versions of the scriptures are not as old as Pali, uh, many of them are written in Sanskrit. This is a bit odd because Sanskrit is the older version of Pali, and yet the Sanskrit scriptures in Buddhism are younger than Pali. And that's because um, several centuries after the um, life of the Buddha, the languages that were spoken in India had evolved, so they were different even from Pali. Pali was no longer widely comprehensible across uh, uh, North India, but Sanskrit still was because that was the language of the Veda, the Hindu scriptures, and that had become the language of the Brahmins, the priest class, and other classes of scholars. And so it was kind of like Latin in Europe in the Middle Ages and Renaissance. It was the standard language of scholarship, even though it was no longer spoken. And so many books would be written in Latin. So too with India at this time, Sanskrit was the standard language of the scholars and the priests. And so later versions of the Pali scriptures were written in Sanskrit. Um, the Sanskrit versions of Buddhist terms are often used in Mahayana and Vajrayana Buddhism because they're being developed in India after the death of the Buddha, several centuries later, a lot of their first texts were in Sanskrit. And even when they become uh, carried over into Chinese, Tibetan, and other languages, the Sanskrit terms might still be used, um, or they might be translated into the other languages, but it's still based on the Sanskrit sutras. So it's for some of these reasons um, that in English, sometimes we know the Sanskrit versions of Buddhist terms like karma more than the Pali versions, kama. It just kind of varies though. Sometimes the Pali versions are more familiar to us. So that's partly why I often give both the Pali and the Sanskrit spelling for various Buddhist terms. Um, the other ancient Indian Buddhist scriptures survive only in fragments in the case of Sanskrit. We do have translations into Chinese or Tibetan of the complete ancient Buddhist canons. But these are arranged and organized differently than the Pali scriptures because they're coming out of Mahayana and Vajrayana Buddhism and they're placed alongside other Mahayana and Vajrayana sutras as well. There are various so-called apocryphal scriptures in Buddhism. Um, apocryphal means basically um, non-canonical, not authoritative. Uh, not tracing back to the original teachings of the Buddha in this case. Now, it's somewhat misleading, I suppose, to call them apocryphal because these are considered actual teachings of the Buddha, 
by Mahayana and Vajrayana Buddhists, but scholars would call them apocryphal or maybe other types of Buddhists because they were in fact, historically speaking, written long after the death of the Buddha. These various apocryphal scriptures claim to be revelations or visions from the Buddha Shakyamuni or another. They continue to be authored to this day, although most of them used by Mahayana and Vajrayana Buddhists are the older ones. So the early Mahayana sutras came from India uh, and later Mahayana sutras were created in China, although they sometimes purport to have been authored in India by the Buddha or some of his other earlier disciples. Mahayana sutras, unlike the Pali Canon, spread through writing initially rather than through oral transmission. They were written down from the very beginning and it's because of the distinctive qualities of texts that were composed uh, in written form rather than in spoken form. That's one of the ways we can identify the fact that um, the Mahayana Sutras don't go back to the Buddha himself in all probability. Um, and the uh, Pali and other ancient canons uh, of scriptures were recited by monks for many generations before they were written down in contrast. So this also shows you that Mahayana spread through the class of literate monks. Um, monks were some of the main Buddhists in ancient India who could read and write um, and they authored written texts, uh, various commentaries on the Pali and Sanskrit sutras, but then they started writing their own as well. And mainly initially they were read and circulated by other monks, others in the educated class, but the Bodhisattva path became popular among many other followers of Buddhism too. And so eventually, once it started spreading, Mahayana Buddhism was not only exclusive to the literate monks who could read the scriptures, but to many other Buddhists as well. The Tantras are those texts associated with Tantric Buddhism. Um, they generally claim the authority of the Buddha or other enlightened beings. By now, Vajrayana Buddhism is most commonly practiced in Tibet, Mongolia, and other parts of Central Asia. Historically, it existed in um, India, and it also spread to East Asia. Uh, it's called Chunyan Buddhism in China or Shingon in Japan, and even to Southeast Asia. Uh, even though Southeast Asia is majority Theravada Buddhist, there is um, a small tradition there of Tantric or Vajrayana Buddhism as well. The picture on the slide is of one of those uh, mandalas or cosmic Buddha diagrams. This one from the Mahavairochana Tantra, but showing you how there is this classification of Buddhas based on their position in the cosmos or world system. And a lot of these um, Buddhas you could kind of visualize or pray to and meditate on as part of your ritual or meditation in Tantric Buddhism. The word Shastra means a uh, collection in Sanskrit. In the Buddhist context, it refers to exegetical or commentary treatises written by scholars to clarify various points of Buddhist doctrine. So uh, one of the most famous is the Abhidharma, uh, Abhidharma Kosha, which is the treasury of the Abhidharma or further higher teaching. And this was a compendium of doctrines and practices by the famous uh, Buddhist monk Vazu Bandhu, who lived in the fourth to fifth centuries AD. Now, every uh, Buddhist nation has produced its own shastras and other exegetical and commentary works. And so it's very common, for example, for Theravada Buddhists, when they study the Pali Canon, they also study the various commentaries on it in order to help interpret it. And that's also partly where we get later uh, Buddhist traditions and teachings entering into the understanding even of the original scriptures, like identifying the figure Rahula from the Pali Canon with being the son of the Buddha, for example. Section 6.3, Beliefs. Something of the Buddhist view of doctrines and beliefs and how to test them is clear in a teaching the Buddha gave to the Kalamas. The Kalamas were villagers that the Buddha came upon in his ministry and they told him they didn't know who or what to believe because different teachers gave them contradictory teachings. So this is the Buddha's answer. It's a quotation from the Anguttara Nikaya 
of the Sutta Pitaka of the Pali Canon. Quote, be not led by reports of tradition or hearsay. Be not led by the authority of religious texts, nor by mere logic or inference, nor by considering appearances. But, O Kalamas, when you know for yourselves that certain actions, certain things are unwholesome, akusala, and wrong and bad, then give them up. And when you know for yourselves that certain things are wholesome, kusala, and good, then accept them and follow them, unquote. So this implies a couple things. One, the proof of a belief is in putting it into practice and through direct knowledge or experience of its effects. So it's kind of giving a, a pragmatic criterion for evaluating beliefs or doctrines, uh, but also saying that direct knowledge through direct experience of the thing and its effect, then um, that that's the criterion for whether to believe it or not. And it rejects other methods of inquiry or bases for belief, like appealing to the authority of religious texts. Uh, the Buddha is probably thinking of the Veda, the Hindu scriptures in that context, but also um, appealing to logic or inference. And you might wonder about this. Well, why would the Buddha reject that as the test for whether something should be believed or followed? There's different answers a person could give to that. But uh, one of the ideas is that people can be misled by bad reasoning and they wouldn't be aware of it unless they put the teaching to the test and tried to observe its effects. So that's something of the Buddhist view of how to test beliefs to know whether they're true. The ultimate test is whether they can be put into practice and lead to, you, could, might, you might say, good consequences or good effects. But notice the term is kusala, wholesome or skillful. So it's something that's actually beneficial to a person, not just something that appears good to them. The Malunkya Putta are the questions of Malunkya. So this was someone who asked the Buddha to answer certain of his questions, and the Buddha refused. So this tells us as well something about the Buddhist attitude towards beliefs or doctrines uh, itself as like a larger issue. Um, there are different interpretations of why the Buddha refused, but his basic reason that he gives is that the answers to these questions are not directly relevant to the Dharma, the Four Noble Truths in particular, which is about suffering, the cause of suffering, that suffering can be ended and how to bring it to an end. So these are more speculative, philosophical or theoretical questions that aren't related to the path to Nirvana. And that's why the Buddha refused to answer them. Uh, other interpretations given of this are that these questions may have no rational answer. Um, they might be presupposing false something false about the way the world is, and so they can't be answered the way that they're phrased. But these were the 10 questions of Malunkya that the Buddha refused to answer. Is the world eternal? Is the world not eternal? Is the world finite? Is the world infinite? Are the mind and body the same? Is the mind one thing and the body another? Does the Tathagata exist after death? Does the Tathagata not exist after death? Does the Tathagata both exist and not exist after death? And finally, does the Tathagata neither exist nor not exist after death? Tathagata means a being gone over there to the other side. It's a way of referring to a Buddha after they've attained Parinirvana or any enlightened being potentially after they've attained Parinirvana. You'll notice that these questions, although they're 10 in number, they come in four main groups. Number one, is the world eternal or not? Is the world finite or not? Are number, uh, number three, are the mind and body the same or different? And number four, all of the questions about the state of existence of a Tathagata or enlightened being after the death of their last body. So um, it's interesting because a lot of these questions were hot topics at the time of the Buddha. A lot of other teachers, philosophers, uh, gurus, leaders of the various um, 
sects of shamans or ascetics would give answers to these questions about whether the world was eternal or not, whether it was infinite or not, the relation between the mind and body, etc. But the Buddha is basically saying those questions are not important to his dharma, to his teaching. Um, in terms of how to interpret uh, whether the questions can be answered, especially with regards to the last four, there does seem to be a belief in Buddhism that the state of being of a Tathagata cannot be defined. So in other words, it's impossible to rationally or, answer, uh, or logically answer those questions about the state of a being, state of being of a Tathagata. So that implies not just that the answers are irrelevant, but they don't exist. Uh, a human being, or at least human language, cannot understand the state of an enlightened being when they no longer have uh, any aspect of themselves in samsara. Um, and this connects to the Buddhist view about what is the state of nirvana. Um, what is the state of an enlightened being who's only experiencing nirvana? The Buddha denies that such a being is like an eternal soul or a supreme being like uh, the Brahman of Hinduism. But they also deny that there is an annihilation of consciousness outside of samsara. So the Buddha explicitly denies the latter view as well. So there's this implication of a kind of eternal consciousness experiencing the bliss of nirvana forever but it's not something that can be defined or perhaps reified as a substance using human terms human concepts and a lot of buddhists would say that our terms our concepts our ideas they only relate to conditioned reality not to absolute nirvana itself um but yeah, th those are some of the, the questions that the Buddha, or all the questions that the Buddha refused to answer. There's also the parable of the poisoned arrow that the Buddha tells in relation to this, which is that if a person was shot by an arrow that carried poison to it, that was killing him, it would be futile and irrelevant to demand answers to a bunch of questions like, what kind of arrow was I shot with? what was the sex or caste or age etc of the person who shot me etc what is really needed is just for a doctor to remove the arrow and to treat the poison thus saving the person so that uh with relation to malunkia's questions that is, is implying that type of parable is implying that even if the questions could be answered they're not relevant to the problem of solving suffering or ending suffering which is the main point of uh, Buddhism. Buddhism can be um, summarized in terms of the three jewels or triratna. These are the three main elements of Buddhism. And these are the three main things that Buddhists worship or revere. The Buddha, his Dharma, and the Sangha or order of monks and nuns. So veneration or worship of the triratna is mainly focused on Buddha Puja or worshiping the Buddha. This is the main type of worship in Buddhism. The picture on the slide has um, the figure of the Trizula or Trident, which is a symbol of the Triratna or Triple Gem or Three Jewels of Buddhism. Um, but this uh, Trizula is also accompanied by the Vajra and the Dhamma Chakra or the Dharma Wheel. I've already explained the Vajra before, but this is the visual symbol of it. It's the power of enlightenment or an enlightened being. Um, and the Dhamma Chakra or Dharma Wheel is a way of summarizing the teaching of the Buddha. You'll notice that this Dhamma Wheel also has eight spokes, which symbolizes the Eightfold Path in particular. Um, the Dharma is the teaching of the Buddha about the nature of existence, you might say. Um, it is the teaching about the nature of our suffering, the cause of the suffering, that suffering can be ended, and how to bring it to an end. So it's focused on 
the state of being of um, sentient beings in samsara and, and how they can attain nirvana. The Dharma, the Buddha doesn't say everything that could be said about existence or reality. He compares what he knows to all the leaves of a tree and what he has taught to a small handful of those leaves that's offered to one of his followers. But the idea is that the Dharma of the Buddha that he taught includes the important things you need to know in order to attain the goal. Uh, in order to live a holy life, it requires acting, living, and also seeing reality in a certain way, not merely verbally affirming the, the beliefs or doctrines that the Buddha taught. Some of the Buddha's teachings are the three characteristics. These apply to samsara or conditioned reality. They are number one, impermanence, number two, suffering, and number three, not self. The um, Pali word for impermanence is anicca, and the Sanskrit word is anitya. The Pali word for suffering is dukkha. Uh, Sanskrit word is also dukkha, although it's pronounced a little bit differently. Um, the Pali word for not self is anatta, and the Sanskrit word for not self is anatman. So um, these three characteristics can be used as elements for reflection whether in meditation or just in general, because the more one understands these three characteristics of samsara, the easier it is for one to end one's attachment to the various things in samsara and thus to end one's suffering. Not self in particular is worth commenting on. The idea is that all of the beings and uh, perceptions or aspects of samsara conditioned existence are not worthy of being regarded as self or one's own or as things that should be identified with um, because everything in samsara including the five aggregates and sentient beings themselves are conditioned causally and impermanent they're not a stable basis for identity or attachment um, there's also the doctrine of emptiness or shunyata, which is emphasized especially by Mahayana Buddhism. Uh, the idea is that everything that exists is empty of inherent existence. So it's going beyond just saying that things are not self or shouldn't be regarded as self or that they're impermanent, ever-changing. It's saying you can't even really identify them as substances with a fixed or discrete nature. Things are all in this mesh or web of interconnectedness. There's various metaphors that are used for this, but all of these things can be used as themes of meditation uh, in order to get people to end their attachment and suffering in samsara. The Four Noble Truths were the basis for the Buddha's first uh, teaching um, in terms of the discourse of the turning of the Dharma wheel. And they're often used as a summary for all the Buddha's Dharma as a whole. So the Four Noble Truths are suffering, the cause of suffering, the end or cessation of suffering, and the path to the cessation of suffering. As previously mentioned, uh, the Buddha defines suffering as clinging to the five aggregates or skandhas. The five aggregates are form, feeling, perception, formation, and consciousness. Form refers to physical objects and the various perceptions of them through the five senses. Um, so both the actual objects and the sensory perception of them are labeled under form. Feeling refers to pleasant, neutral, or unpleasant sensations that arise in a person's consciousness, the consciousness of a sentient being, in response to the perception of form. Uh, the word perception here, even though I just used it in a different way, is referring to something specific. It might also be uh, translated as cognition because it's not just a sense perception. The third of the five aggregates, although it's often called perception, is using the word perception in a particular sense i.e. a classification of a type of being as belonging to one 
a species or genus, one type or another. So for example, when you uh, perceive an object with the senses, but think or classify it as its kind, like that is a cup or that is a person or that even something um, psychological like that is suffering, all those would be examples of perception in this sense. So it's a type of mental activity, type of cognition. Formation is where we get the will entering into things. Formation is named because it's representing a being shaping or forming their reality through karma and intention. So it's symbolized by a um, potter who's shaping a ceramic vessel out of clay. So it's this idea of an active willing or intending. And this is really the process that creates um, suffering, but also liberation through the fourth um, aggregate of formation. And then the fifth aggregate is consciousness or awareness. And it includes the mind's awareness of all of the other four aggregates, as well as potentially of itself. Why are these things called aggregates? Well, the idea is that each of them is a heap or bundle of different stuff. So even though each one can be spoken of individually, they um, are themselves collectives of particulars. So for example, a form, there's lots of different forms, lots of different types of perceptions and physical objects, but even within one of those types, even a single example, like one particular cup, for example, is going to be made of many smaller particles and subtypes and so on and so on. Even for the psychological phenomena, there are actually heaps or bundles of stuff. And the Theravada Buddhist view, for example, is that you can actually, through meditating and developing your mind, analyze each of the aggregates into their smallest components, which are like metaphysical atoms. Um, but you can only do that through uh, training the mind in meditation. Ordinarily, we just perceive them as these inchoate heaps or bundles of stuff. The second noble truth is that the cause of suffering is craving or thirst. The Pali word for that is tanha. The Sanskrit word for thirst is trishna. They are related to the English word thirst. But it's a type of desire that can be intense, but it's always laced with the sense of self or ego. The third noble truth is that there is an end to suffering. However, the end of suffering can only be realized by abandoning, abandoning its cause of craving or thirst. The fourth noble truth is that there is a path to bringing about the permanent end or cessation of suffering, and that is the noble eightfold path uh, about which more shortly. So the overall picture of the Buddha's teaching is that all of the beings, the sentient or conscious beings trapped in samsara are there because of their own craving and delusion. And the craving and the delusion go together because when you're able to end your delusion or ignorance, when you can see reality for what it is, then the craving can also be ended. So a bit more about the fourth of the Four Noble Truths, the Noble Eightfold Path. These are the eight main parts of Buddhist practice. One, right view. Two, right resolve. Three, right speech. Four, right action. Five, right livelihood. Six, right effort. Seven, right mindfulness. And eight, right concentration. These can be divided into three main parts. Wisdom which is Panya in Pali or Pragya in Sanskrit, includes the first three, or sorry, the first two, right view and right resolve. Morality or Sila includes the next three, right speech, right action, and right livelihood. And meditation or Samadhi includes the last three, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. The order of the parts of the path is significant because even though wisdom is not perfected until the whole path is perfected, you need to begin with a certain amount of wisdom in order to have the understanding and motivation to develop the path as a whole. Morality concerns outer action, and this needs to be developed in order to provide a basis for developing the mind through meditation. And then developing meditation will help you develop your wisdom. 
all of these parts of the path though interact with each other um, so there's not just a linear sequence there's a bit of a linear sequence but there's also a non-linear sequence as well so a bit more about the various parts of the noble eightfold path right view basically means understanding and viewing reality through the perspective of the four noble truths so it's not just believing them and affirming them as doctrines or dogmas verbally but being able to analyze one's own experience in terms of suffering its cause its end and the path for example being able to see suffering in your own mind and being able to see it being caused by craving uh, right resolve could also be translated as right thought or right intention so this is basically having the right sorts of thoughts or intentions um, and, and not having the wrong ones so this is kind of already getting into uh, karma and being sure that you're not using your will in a harmful or destructive way the next uh, three parts of the path relate to morality right speech includes things like not lying but also like not gossiping or um, divisive speech which causes people to turn against each other or um, idle speech that doesn't have a significant purpose to it related to the path um, and other things like that so right action includes um, things like not uh, engaging in sex if you're a monk or basically not fornicating or committing adultery if you're a lay person um, not harming or killing um, avoiding alcohol etc right livelihood is basically earning a living or having a lifestyle that doesn't violate any of the other rules of morality like don't sell alcohol or be um, a, an arms dealer for instance uh, and then the the right med or meditation includes developing the mind so that you can ultimately see the four noble truths and just the nature of reality better and this is done systematically and will eventually enable you to uh, attain enlightenment meditation is divided into three main parts the effort mindfulness and concentration nowadays it's very common for buddhists to regard mindfulness as a separate type of meditation technique than concentration um, so that's for example the way it's been taught in the burmese uh, meditation method that was developed in burma um, in the late 18 early 1900s but um, my understanding this is based mainly on Tanasaro Bhikkhu the uh, aforementioned Thai forest tradition monk and my own on the reading of the Pali scriptures the way the Thai forest tradition understands this is that actually uh, mindfulness is part of the same meditation technique as concentration it's not a different type of meditation rather it's just a part of developing concentration and this makes sense if you look at the path because effort is regarded as a precursor for concentration or meditation samadhi you have to have the sort of willpower and effort to develop wholesome states and to um, enhance the wholesome states you already have and to get rid of unwholesome states uh, and to not have unwholesome states in the future so that's kind of the basis for um, developing your meditation mindfulness means keeping the object or theme of your meditation in mind like the breath for example it's focusing on the breath and then returning to it when your attention wanders and then concentration is what happens when you have the right effort and the right mindfulness it's like a success state where you bring your mind through mindfulness back to the same object you're going to be able to make your mind focused and clear which is the state of uh, concentration so uh, what are the main moral principles of Buddhism they're called the five precepts or the five vows pancha sila this the first one is to abstain from harm or violence ahimsa the second is to abstain from taking what is not given so this is asteya or not stealing the third one is to abstain from sexual misconduct now both monks and lay people follow the five precepts for monks this means avoiding sex of any kind 
for lay people, this means not having sex with someone who uh, is not in a position to consent, either because they're too young, they don't have the position of their, the permission of their family, because they're already married to someone else, etc. The fourth is to abstain from false speech, so not lying. And this overlaps with um, the idea of right speech from the Eightfold Path. And the fifth is to abstain from intoxicants that cause heedlessness. So this was not actually part of the definitions of right speech and right action from the Noble Eightfold Path list. Each of those two main steps of the Eightfold Path has a more detailed sublist, but it's based on other things that the Buddha taught about the dangers of alcohol and other intoxicants that make you less aware of yourself and your surroundings. So devout Buddhists will not uh, consume alcohol. The four Brahma Viharas are uh, tangentially related to morality, so they're worth bringing up here. Brahma Vihara means a divine dwelling or a divine state of being. Brahma is a type of uh, celestial or heavenly being in Buddhism. It's the same word as Brahma in Hinduism, which means a creator god. One of the Brahmas, according to Buddhism, is a creator god, although not thought of as an all-powerful or all-knowing being. Um, in fact, the Buddha is portrayed in the Pali Canon as knowing more and being wiser than Brahma. But nevertheless, there are um, many classes of heavenly beings called Brahmas. There's a few different varieties of them, but they live on these heavenly uh, realms of existence. And each of those heavenly realms or levels of the heavens is connected to one of these sublime or divine states of mind or consciousness. Um, and these are things that are good to deliberately cultivate, both in meditation and as the basis for being moral or treating other beings well. So the four Brahma Viharas are loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. Um, loving kindness is called metta in Pali or Maitri in Sanskrit. Uh, it refers basically to having goodwill to other beings, wishing their authentic well-being. It can also be translated as goodwill or as friendliness. Um, compassion means having goodwill to people when they are suffering. So having a type of empathy for the suffering of other beings. It's karuna in uh, Pali. Sympathetic joy um, is mudita in Pali. This means having um, goodwill to people when they are experiencing something good, like being happy for them, not being envious, etc. And equanimity, mean, uh, called upekka in sans, uh, Pali, means that even when um, you can't control things, when something good or bad is happening that might disturb you, might disturb your goodwill, the fact that you have goodwill for other beings doesn't lead to a psychological disturbance. Like you can be equanimous or at peace and calm even when someone you have compassion for um, is having a rough time, for example. Um, so all of these states can be interpreted as extensions of loving kindness or metta. They can also be used as objects of meditation where you try to focus on one of these states of being and cultivate it deliberately in your mind. But they're listed here, I'm listening, listing them here under the discussion of morality because you can see in Buddhism, it's a very big part of their belief to develop and have compassion and goodwill for other beings. And that's also supposed to be reflected in your actions of not harming, of being generous to other people, etc. So action uh, is a way of translating karma. Karma is the Sanskrit spelling. The Pali spelling is kamma. So you'll sometimes see that as well. Kamma is divided into two main types, wholesome or skillful, which is kusala, and the reverse, unwholesome or unskillful, which is akusala. So the idea is, uh, as reflected in the earlier quotation from the Buddha to the Kalamas, you want to put your actions and beliefs into practice and observe very carefully what happens when you're acting and after to try to figure out if they are beneficial or harmful. 
There's a belief in Buddhism, this is taught by the Buddha in some of his sutras, of a mutuality in the well-being, the good, uh, the state of goodness of various sentient beings, such that if one person or being harms another, they will themselves be harmed. This is related to the law of karma. Um, the idea is that our fates are all kind of interconnected. So if you harm another being, then you yourself are going to get some bad consequence or some harm in the future. So in Buddhism, uh, if you understand that teaching of the Buddha, there isn't really a conflict fundamentally between a sentient being's self-interest or egoism and the well-being or interest of other beings. So they should realize that altruism or caring for the well-being of others aligns perfectly with their own self-interest or egoism. Um, there is another teaching related to karma in the Dhammapada. This is one of the um, texts from the Sutta Pitaka of the Pali Canon, where it's basically saying that a person's thoughts or their intentions determine their own existence. Um, and so there's a close connection between all of the moral rules of Buddhism and these teachings about karma, because it's in everyone's self-interest to have good thoughts and to have good will and to treat others well, because that's going to impact their own future and their own well-being. So a bit more about the Buddhist teachings on meditation. As mentioned, all three of those parts of the um, end of the Eightfold Path are stages in the development of meditation. The purpose of the right effort is to have this willpower, this desire, this drive to tame, to train and direct one's own mind. But it doesn't happen naturally. So the Buddha doesn't teach, at least not in his original sutras, that the mind is inherently pure or inherently enlightened. The mind is a mix of good and bad, and so it takes deliberate effort to train it. Uh, mindfulness is sati. Uh, in, in Pali, and this means remembering or returning to an object of awareness, keeping it in mind, keeping the breath in mind, keeping a mantra in mind, keeping a visualization in one's mind, etc. Right concentration or samadhi uh, can also be translated as meditation. It's when the mind is successfully focused on one object and it's one pointed in two ways. The mind is gathered together in one point. It's not scattered here and there with different objects of attention. And uh, being unified, it's able to keep itself focused on the single object of its meditation. So the basic method for meditation is to find a relatively secluded place. Could be a room, could be under a tree, could be a cave, etc. To sit with one's back upright, have a stable posture. So um, this is believed to facilitate the efforts of the mind to gain focus. And then to direct the mind through mindfulness to the object, theme, or subject of one's meditation, such as the breath. When the mind wanders, one is simply um, supposed to bring it back to the theme, gently but firmly. So breath is a common focus of meditation. This can include the literal physical breath, but also the various vital energies of the body. Um, another common meditation is loving kindness, metta or maitri meditation, where you try to cultivate this attitude of loving kindness or goodwill to all beings. When meditation is carried out successfully, it can lead to the dhyanas or jhanas in Pali. Those are the absorption, states of intense concentration, where one's mind is fully at peace, fully uh, purified of suffering and delusion, at least temporarily. Um, the sculpture on the slide shows a picture of a seated Buddha in meditation. Just notice the gestures of his hands. This is the dhyana mudra um, that is often used by Buddhists during meditation. So uh, one hand, the left hand lies flat, the right hand is placed on the left, and the two thumbs are touching. So a bit more about the culmination of Buddhist meditation. 
the jhanas or the dhyanas are those focused states of mind, the absorption, and they lead to samatha and vipassana. Samatha means calm or tranquility. So the mind is free of suffering, it's at peace. Vipassana means insight or seeing clearly. So one of the goals of meditation is to be able to train the mind so it sees itself and reality more clearly and accurately. This can give direct awareness of the Dharma, seeing the Four Noble Truths, for example, as they're operating in the mind. Meditation is the only method through which the three poisons, the kalesas or kleshas, can be uprooted. The three poisons or taints include greed, lopa, hatred, dosa, and delusion, moha. Delusion is very important because central to it is this false belief in a permanent, real, or unconditioned self. And for a Buddhist, that belief in a um, fictitious self is connected to craving and thus to suffering. The phenomena of experience are shown through meditation to be not self, impermanent, and empty of inherent existence, as well as being suffering, um, as per the three characteristics. Another important teaching of Buddhism, um, not directly related to the Noble Eightfold Path, is that of rebirth or reincarnation. Rebirth of sentient beings is based on their karma. Hindu uh, Buddhists don't believe in an eternal soul or self, unlike Hindus and Jains. And this is one of the reasons why a lot of people, at least in the English literature, will often use the term rebirth instead of reincarnation to refer to this Buddhist doctrine. A lot of people believe that the word reincarnation has more of a connotation of an eternal self or soul that's reborn into different bodies, whereas rebirth doesn't have that connotation. I think that's a little silly. I think either rebirth or reincarnation might make a person think that there's an eternal self or soul that's being reborn or reincarnated. But nevertheless, it's kind of a stylistic um, convention that oftentimes the Buddhist theory of reincarnation will be termed rebirth specifically to distinguish it from the Hindu or Jain view of reincarnation. In the Buddhist view, sentient beings or bhavas uh, do not have and are not eternal selves or souls with a fixed nature that links them over time. However, there is a real connection that kind of grounds the identity or quasi-identity of a sentient being across time and across their various incarnations. What is that link? What is that glue? Well, it's their karma. Because at a certain time, a sentient being will have a thought, an intention, an act of willing or formation. That is their karma. Uh, and that will give them the same being, so to speak, uh, a phenomenal experience in th uh, their, that life in the future or in a future life, a future reincarnation. So karma, the fact that it does causally connect a being through its various actions and experiences or phenomena, that's what grounds their identity, not an eternal self, not an eternal soul. In any event, the reincarnation or rebirth of sentient beings in samsara will continue until they have successfully uprooted the three poisons, the three kaleshas of greed, hatred, and delusion. By the way, in the center of the bhava chakra or wheel of being on the picture on the right, the very center wheel of it um, shows three animals, a snake, a bird, a, a rooster in this case, and a pig. Those symbolize the three poisons of hatred or aversion, greed, and delusion or ignorance, respectively. Um, so this Baba Chakra, this particular version of it is from, um, looks like Tantric or Tibetan Buddhism. Um, but it can be used by other Buddhists as well. It's a symbol of Buddhist cosmology or their theory of the structure of the universe. And in particular, I'm using it here to illustrate the doctrine of the realms of rebirth. Now, there's actually in total dozens or more states of being that a sentient being can be born into because each of the five or six main realms of rebirth has many subdivisions. For example, the many different types of animals in the animal realm or the many different types of humans in the human realm, etc. 
So um, Buddhists will often talk about the six realms of rebirth. Sometimes they talk about the five. Um, this particular diagram of the Bhava Chakra has five. Um, so, you know, the, I'm using it to illustrate the notion of the five realms of rebirth, but just note that there's also a sixth realm that a lot of Buddhists believe in. So, um, these realms are each characterized by a different state of mind or consciousness that's most common for the beings born into that realm. So, for example, um, the hell realms are those that are occasioned with the most pain or suffering. And in the heavens, there still is suffering because this is samsara, it's not nirvana. However, heavens are the most pleasant realms. Animal realms have the most delusion or ignorance. Um, the hungry ghost realm is most connected with um, greed. Um, and the realm of the asuras, the jealous or the angry gods, is the one most connected with hatred, aversion, or anger. The human realm is regarded as having an equal mix of all those different things. So the hell realms are where beings are reborn if they have really bad karma, like if they murdered someone in a past life. Um, and they'll be tormented there by hell beings for many, many years until they're reborn into a different realm. The animal realm contains all of the normal animals that humans interact with. Um, they are part of this cycle of rebirth, but um, as with the other realms apart from the human, they can't generally uh, you know, become monks or practice the Dharma. The human birth is actually considered very important in Buddhism because this is the birth that you're able to practice the Dharma, become a monk, and potentially gain Nirvana from. The third realm is that of the hungry ghosts or prettas. So in Buddhist uh, cosmology, Ghosts are actually a part of the cycle of samsara. Not everyone will necessarily become a ghost in their next life. Um, people or other beings can be reborn as ghosts, often if they're very attached to particular things that they had experienced in their past life. So a ghost may be reborn in an area near where they lived as a human. And they're often symbolized in Buddhism or depicted as having very big bellies and very narrow necks. This is a way of expressing that they have this hunger, this thirst, this craving, this greed for things that they experienced in their past life. And they have a very large belly they want to fill, but they can't actually fill it because they can't swallow. They can't eat things literally and metaphorically that they encounter. So they're constantly suffering because of that. Um, the celestial realms are those of various heavenly beings, including devas or gods, Brahmas, which are various other classes of celestial beings in Buddhism, those are generally ones that are experiencing the Brahma Viharas, those refined states of consciousness of uh, goodwill, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. Each of these realms of rebirth is thus simultaneously um, a state of being or a state of consciousness, as well as having a type of physical or other form. Although in the higher celestial or heavenly realms, some of those divine beings are ones that don't have perceptible bodies or forms. And those include the Brahma Viharas actually specifically. And then um, the realm of the Asuras. Asuras are beings also in Hinduism. They are interpreted as demons or evil giants that often war with the good gods. And uh, in Buddhism, um, the realm of the Asuras would be another realm where there are these godlike or supernatural beings, but they're not good, unlike the Devas or Brahmas. They are um, angry or jealous of each other. They're constantly fighting, etc. Now, um, it's worth noting that in Buddhism, although they believe in heavenly realms, heaven is not the main point of the religion. Heaven is a reward you get for good karma, but it doesn't last forever because your past karma is going to be finite. And so eventually after your heavenly birth, you're going to be reborn into a different body, usually one in one of the lower realms. The ultimate goal of Buddhism is to attain nirvana and thus to transcend the circle or the cycle of reincarnation in general. Now, you can see pictured on the Bhava Chakra or Wheel of Being on the upper right, a Buddha who is outside of the realms of rebirth. So they've transcended the cycle of samsara. The Buddha there is pointing to the Dharma wheel um, to the left and pointing to the Dharma, pointing to how to transcend this. And you also notice the demon being Mara, who is kind of holding the wheel of samsara in his grip. 
So Mara is like an evil being who keeps being trapped in samsara using the three kaleshas, the three poisons to do so. So a bit more about these states of being outside of the realms of rebirth. Nirvana is a way of talking about the reality outside of samsara, outside of the realms of rebirth. It's when you've extinguished or put an end to the three poisons and thus ended craving, clinging, suffering, and rebirth in samsara. Buddhas are the beings that find the path to nirvana and teach it to their entire world. So a Buddha will only arise when the Dharma has been lost, forgotten, or misunderstood, so beings are no longer able to use it to attain nirvana. Arhants are also beings that have attained nirvana, like Buddhas, but they follow the path to nirvana that's been previously taught by a Buddha in their world and age. There are some um, Abhava chakras uh, that would also depict a pure land or a Buddha realm, so this is also part of Buddhist cosmology at least in Mahayana Buddhism. These are created by Buddhas like Amitabha Buddha to help other sentient beings. They're not the same as Nirvana. Technically, they're in Samsara, but they're very pure, peaceful realms where the Buddha will manifest there and directly teach the Dharma to other beings reborn there. So it's kind of like a heavenly realm, but one that's even better than a heaven because you can hear and understand the Dharma perfectly there and then after that attain Nirvana. The Bodhisattva vow in Mahayana Buddhism has as its goal to become a Buddha, not just an Arhant, and thus to be reborn in a world and an age where the Dharma has been lost, forgotten, or misunderstood, teach the Dharma, and thus help all those other beings there attain nirvana. When I use the words world or world system or universe, that's a way of talking about the Buddhist view that there are many, many existing bhava chakras or systems of many, many realms or worlds within them. So each world system or universe has all of those five or six realms of rebirth and all of those countless sentient beings in them. But Buddhists believe there's not just one universe like that, but essentially um, an infinite or indefinitely large number of them. That overall cosmology is similar to that of Hinduism, although the details vary. And um, one of the significances of the teachings of the many different world systems is that each world system can have its, Buddha, its own Buddha, even at a given point in time. And that's one of the reasons why in Mahayana Buddhism, there are so many Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. There are many of our own world system and its various ages, um, but there's also other worlds or world systems out there with their own Buddhas and Bodhisattvas in them. Section 6.4, we're gonna talk briefly about some of the main Buddhist practices, including their worship and festivals. Puja means worship or prayer. The main type of puja performed by Buddhists is Buddha puja, which is prayers, chants, or offerings, such as incense, flowers, or fruit, honoring the Buddha and or the rest of the triple gem, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. In Theravada Buddhism, they mainly practice Buddha puja uh, with regards to Siddhartha Gautama or Shakyamuni Buddha specifically. Occasionally, they'll also worship the next Buddha, Maitreya Buddha. In Mahayana Buddhism, as previously discussed, they worship many other Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, not only Maitreya, but also Avalokiteshvara, uh, Manjushri, and many, many others, Amitabha. In Vajrayana Buddhism, they have the same, uh, or many of the same Buddhas and Bodhisattvas as in Mahayana, but they will also worship other gods and goddesses regarded as protectors of the Dharma. Um, Buddhist temple worship has a similar overall pattern, actually, to that of Hinduism and Jainism, but they just worship different beings. So the pattern that's similar is giving food offerings or other offerings like fruits, lights, flowers, incense, um, on an altar before a murti, an image or icon. The difference is that in the Buddhist temple, the image or icon is going to be of a Buddha or Bodhisattva. And also, um, the food offerings will be shared after not only among the lay people, but also among the monks or nuns 
that are in attendance. The monks will do chantings that uh, in Pali, Sanskrit, and other language um, that serve to bless the food, make it holy. But the food is um, not being given to gods, for example, like it is in Hinduism. Dana means giving or generosity. Um, it includes charitable giving, uh, helping other people generally, but also most especially giving to monks and nuns. Alms giving is a type of dana involving giving food to monks in their alms bowl. Dana is a very important Buddhist practice, even though it's not mentioned in the Eightfold Path, it is taught by the Buddha. It's the most common way, in fact, for lay people to earn merit or punya, about which more later. Monks can chant blessings during a ceremony to mark the occasion of the dana. So this happens uh, in rituals when lay people go to a temple or monastery to give offerings to the monks. Dana is regarded as an unstated preliminary to the Noble Eightfold Path. It's the easiest part of Buddhism to practice in a sense, because anyone, even someone who's a sinner, who has bad karma, or who has an unruly mind, usually has the ability to discipline themselves enough to at least give something to charity or give something to a monk or nun. So I mentioned this word merit or punya. This is a way of conceiving of good karma in somewhat quantifiable terms. So it's basically a measure of one's good karma that one has accumulated from dana, generosity, following the five vows or precepts, panchasila, or through doing meditation practice, samadhi. There's also a Buddhist concept of merit transfer. So there's a notion that if you accumulate through a merit through generosity, good deeds, or meditation, you can actually share some of the fruits or benefits of your merit with other sentient beings. So you can magnify or multiply that merit through your act of generosity. Uh, what you see in the picture on the slide is an example of a merit transfer ceremony. In this case, this is in Thailand. The prime minister of Thailand on the left is offering a meal to 83 monks uh, shown in the platform on the back. And there's a ritual of symbolically transferring the merit by pouring water into a bowl. In other words, he's created an act of great merit by sharing food with all of these monks, but he wants to share the merit he's earning with other sentient beings. And this multiplies the merit in two ways. It's a further act of merit to share your merit with others and directly by sharing that merit, sharing that good karma with other sentient beings. In Mahayana Buddhism, they often regard Buddhas and Bodhisattvas as having vast stores of extra merit they've accumulated that they can share with other beings who pray to them through a kind of grace. Now we'll talk about some of the main um, Buddhist festivals. Vesak or Vaishika is the Buddha's birthday. It occurs on the eighth day of the sixth lunar month on the Buddhist calendar. So because um, Buddhists like Hindus use a lunar calendar for their festivals, the date of Vesak or Vaishika will vary in our modern solar calendar. It usually falls in May or June. Japan has fixed the date of Vesak to be April 8th, which they've done with some of their other um, Buddhist calendars, uh, Buddhist festivals as well. The Buddha's birthday is the main purpose or main uh, commemoration of Vesak. Mahayana Buddhists believe that Vesak only celebrates the Buddha's birthday, but in Theravada Buddhism, they believe the same day, the same um, cycle uh, of the moon, full moon, was also the occasion of the Buddha's awakening, his Bodhi, and of his death or Parinirvana. So all three of those are celebrated um, on the same day in Theravada Buddhism. Um, another major Buddhist festival is Asaha Puja. This occurs on the 15th day of the eighth lunar month in the Buddhist calendar. It usually falls in July. This commemorates the Buddha's first sermon, the Dhamma Chaka Bhavatana Sutta, or Discourse of the Turning of the Wheel of the Dharma. So it's the beginning of his ministry. Um, there's also the season of Vasa, 
which begins after Asalha Puja. This is a three month long period. It's called the rains retreat or the rainy season. It generally falls between July and October. And it's so named because in India, this is the period of the, the monsoons or intense rains. And a lot of monks would stop their traveling ministry during this period to avoid um, floods and just the difficulty of traveling in the rain. So they would usually just stay in one place. And this is sometimes called the Buddhist Lent because it's a period of fasting, of additional renunciations, and of meditating for long periods. Um, so Buddhist lay people during Vasa may uh, meditate or take on additional precepts, usually reserved for monks during the Vasa season. And then another um, important Buddhist festival in Mahayana Buddhism as practiced in East, East Asia is the uh, Ghost Festival or Chong Yuan Jia in Chinese called Oban in Japanese. This occurs on the 15th day of the seventh lunar month of the Chinese calendar. And this usually falls in August or September on the solar calendar. So um, this is a development of East Asian Mahayana Buddhism. Um, and it's showing the overlap between Buddhism in China and other parts of East Asia and the importance of remembering and honoring the ancestors, which you see in Confucianism as well in uh, Chinese culture. So in the um, ghost festival, ghosts will visit the living from the realms of the dead. And Chinese families will often gather to honor their departed ancestors um, at, the, at the tomb. Um, and the offerings that are given are believed to ease the way for their departed ancestors as they go into successive lives or incarnations. Um, there also is a practice of uh, lights or lanterns or lamps that are placed on paper boats in water to give guidance to the lost ghosts or souls or sentient beings in their next incarnation. Section 6.5, Modern Buddhism. Uh, by this, we're going to talk about the history of Buddhism in the last couple hundred years or so. So uh, before we get to modern Buddhism, we're going to start with the history, the later history of Buddhism in India. Buddhism is mostly gone in the modern nation of India today, even though that's where it originated um, along the Ganges River Valley. Um, Buddhism gradually declined in India in the first millennium AD and was mostly gone by the late 12th century. There are various reasons for this. One is that a lot of the kings, uh, the various dynasties in India, both in the north and south, stopped promoting Buddhism at a certain point. They were mainly uh, promoting uh, Bhakti Hinduism and later on Islam. In antiquity, there was a class of seafaring merchants who did a lot of the trade between India and other places that could be accessed to the sea, like the islands of Indonesia to the east. These merchants apparently were often Buddhist. I've read that that was in part or maybe in whole because the ancient uh, form of Hinduism or Vedic religion had prohibitions uh, or requirements for doing certain Vedic rituals that couldn't be done um, at sea but had to be done on land. Whereas it was less of a problem with regards to their religion for Buddhists to be seafaring merchants. Regardless of whether that's com the complete story, at one point in the early history of India, we're looking now at the first few centuries BC uh, and AD, a lot of the um, Buddhist, uh, a lot of the seafaring merchants were Buddhist. And so some of these were wealthy, so they could give uh, donations and offerings to the Buddhist monks and thus sustaining their religion. But also um, they could have Buddhist monks and others travel them to spread, travel with them to spread their religion. Um, as they were sailing around the world trading. Um, that declined. At some point, those Buddhist merchants were mainly replaced by Muslim merchants. And not only did that lead to um, an end of uh, uh, the patronage that the Buddhist merchants had provided to the monks in India, helping them decline there, that also set up for the spread of Islam to other parts of Southeast Asia. Um, but one of the biggest uh, factors actually was the rise of bhakti or devotional Hinduism in the first millennium AD. 
that was the popular form of Hinduism that a lot of the Hindu uh, kings in India were promoting. And it also appears to have grown at the extent, sorry, at the expense of Buddhism and Jainism and some other ancient sects. So um, Buddhism largely was um, dying out in India. There were still some Buddhist monasteries as you get to the later centuries of the first millennium AD, some of which were very important in terms of the scholarship and philosophy they produced. There was a Buddhist uh, monastic university at uh, Nalanda, for example. Um, Buddhism became concentrated in these monasteries and in these universities in North India, such as at Taxila and Nalanda. And uh, what happened was there would be some lay people supporting them uh, in the surrounding area, but they were largely supported by the lands that they owned. And so they could just tax the farmers, tax the villages to um, give themselves upkeep. And they didn't rely on a large population of Buddhist lay people that they had to preach to make sure they stayed Buddhist to support them as well. A lot of the uh, monks who made up the monasteries, they might have been from non-Buddhist Brahmin families, but some Brahmins became interested in Buddhist uh, philosophy or um, doctrine and then so decided to convert to Buddhism. But the fact that most of the Buddhists were just there um, practicing at these monasteries meant that Buddhism became vulnerable. Once the monasteries were destroyed, as they later were, um, by Muslim armies from the Delhi Sultanate, uh, then Buddhism effectively died out in India. So how exactly did the later form of Buddhism in India focused on monasteries like Taxila and uh, Nalanda? How did they come to an end? Well, there were a couple of events. One was there were various nomads, including um, some Huns and later Turks and Mongols, uh, who repeatedly invaded North India, many of them going through the same migration route, actually, as the Aryans had done centuries earlier, the Khyber Pass and what's now Afghanistan. So um, some of the, the Hunnic invasions in the 5th century AD destroyed some Buddhist monasteries. The later invaders, many of them were Turks, Afghans, and um, a dynasty calling themselves the Mughals. They regarded themselves as uh, related to the Mongols. I'm not sure that's entirely true, but they called themselves after the Mongols. They, these were all various Central Asian, uh, many of them Turkish speaking peoples that had a way of life similar to that of the Mongols and other Central Asian steppe nomads. But the death blow to Buddhism in India came under the Delhi Sultans. Qutb Uddin Aibak conquered Northeast India in the 12th century, and he destroyed the Mahabodhi Temple in Bodh Gaya. That was the temple um, in the place where Buddha was believed to have attained enlightenment under the Bodhi tree. That was one of the central pilgrimage sites of Buddhism that was still visited, for example, by a lot of Buddhists outside India, as well as those who had remained in India by that time. And then Ikhtihar Uddin uh, Muhammad bin Bakhtiyar Khilji invaded Magadha, um, one of the ancient Indian kingdoms uh, in the Northeast, and destroyed the Buddhist Nalanda University and other sites. And after that happened, um, that was basically the end of Buddhism in India. Um, the remaining Buddhist temples were destroyed by the later Muslim dynasty of the Mughals, and they converted some of them into mosques as well. There was also um, a period of European colonialism, not only of India, but other parts of Southeast Asia and other nations that were um, Buddhist. Sri Lanka is the island off the south coast of India. Um, they were ruled for many centuries by um, a monarchy called the Kandian Kingdom, named after the capital of Kandy. This ended in 1815 um, under British rule, and British colonial rule continued there until 1948. Buddhism survived in Sri Lanka despite the activity of some um, British Christian missionaries there. Burma, now known as Myanmar, was also a British colony. Um, it was later part of the British East India Empire, um, and it included, uh, the, the British gradually took over from the years 1793 to 1885. They attained independence in 1948, 
they practiced Theravada Buddhism and that was not really significantly disrupted at all during the period of British colonial rule. French Indochina was a French colony um, that existed in the 1800s. It includes the modern nations of Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. Cambodia and Laos both practice forms of Theravada Buddhism. Vietnam practices various kinds of Buddhism um, linked to East Asian Chinese Buddhism, so various forms of Mahayana predominantly. Um, when the French ruled French Indochina, they did have some converts to Catholicism, especially in Vietnam, but it's not as if Buddhism was wiped out. Um, it remained especially strong in Cambodia and Laos. Um, French Indochina attained independence after World War II. There was a lot of fighting, civil war, um, the Vietnam War, uh, etc., the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia that disrupted the practice of Buddha Buddhism there, about which more later. Um, China uh, was uh, never controlled by a foreign power completely, but there were various Western powers that had a presence there and were given some extraterritorial rights um, over their little enclaves in the Chinese uh, port cities like Shanghai. Um, and this happened from 1839 to 1865. So um, there were also earlier periods of European contact, such as under the Portuguese in the 1600s, when Catholic Jesuit missionaries came to China. They had a few successes in converting people to Catholicism, but most of the population practiced a mix of Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism up till modern times. The main um, decline of Buddhism in China was caused by the takeover of the communists in 1949, um, and also just through the process of modernization and secularization that a lot of uh, modern societies have gone through. The Japanese also had an imperial phase where they controlled parts of China in the 20th century, but that didn't significantly impact the um, practice of Buddhism there. So a bit more about Buddhism during the 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, Westerners started to study Buddhism um, as they traveled to Asia, including India and other parts of Asia in the 1800s, especially. A lot of these um, parts of Asia were being colonized by um, Western powers like Britain um, and India. And before Britain there in the 1700s, there was also France, the Netherlands, and originally the Portuguese going back to the uh, 1500s. But um, during the British rule of India in the 1800s and just the expansion of European colonies throughout Asia in the 17 and 1800s, that's when you get more contact traders missionaries, scholars, uh, colonial rulers, etc., people working for the um, colonial governments there, that's when they start to learn more about Buddhism. Um, there were also, so the travelers from the West, from Europe to Asia, began to study and interpret Buddhism in the 1800s. And eventually they brought back texts that were studied by European Orientalist scholars um, mainly ones that lived and worked in Europe, but they got access to the, the sources. In the early 19th century, a lot of the sources were oral. So like Western travelers or people working for the government who talked to Buddhists and just learned about the religion that way. Later on in the 19th century, there was more systematic study and translation of Buddhist scriptures themselves, including the Pali Canon. Uh, so in Sri Lanka, there is uh, an especially important set of developments with regards to the history of Buddhism. Um, Sri Lanka was part of the Indian, uh, British Indian Empire. And under the British rule, there were some British missionary, missionaries of various Protestant sects, such as Methodist, Presbyterian, some Unitarian, who came to India. They didn't have much success at converting people. There were some Protestant Christian converts in um, Northeastern India. Uh, like in the hill country um, around Bengal. Uh, and, but the mainly um, in Sri Lanka, which was a part of that uh, British empire in India, the, the Protestant Christian missionaries had a few converts, but not a lot. The Buddhists uh, were actually reacting against these Christian missionaries because they thought their religion might be threatened 
Um, so they wanted to reform and revive the religion to avoid the island becoming um, Christian because they thought Buddhism was very intimately connected, not only to the Candian dynasty that ruled Sri Lanka at the time, but also to their whole history. Nevertheless, um, as part of this reaction against Protestant Christianity and revival of Buddhism, uh, new forms of Buddhism were developed that were partially infant, influenced by British Protestant Christianity. So one of the key figures in the revival was Anagarika Dharmapala. He was a Sri Lankan Buddhist monk. Um, he's also, you could regard him as a kind of early example of Buddhist modernism. Um, so one of the things that they promoted in the Buddhist revival in Sri Lanka was printed editions of the Pali Canon and scriptures and having lay people study the Buddhist scriptures, not just the monks. So the reason why that might show the influence of Protestant Christianity is because Protestant Christians think that every Christian should be able to read the Bible, have a copy of it, study it directly, etc. Previously in Buddhism, it was mainly only the monks that would study or read the scriptures, at least systematically. The lay people would be exposed to them, but mainly just in the liturgy, the chants that would happen at Buddhist temples. Um, another uh, Protestant Christian-ish practice that was uh, adopted by um, Theravada Buddhists in Sri Lanka at this time was having the whole congregation chant or say hymns together or composing new hymns um, that are intended mainly for lay participation in liturgy. There were there was chanting done uh, even by lay people before this, but it's a matter of the style of the hymns and the emphasis. Another um, aspect of the Buddhist revival was the establishment of the Young Men's Buddhist Association, or YMBA. And yes, this was inspired by the YMCA, or Young Men's Christian Association, which was a kind of British Protestant thing from the 19th century. The purpose of this YMBA was to get lay people, young lay men specifically, involved in the religion, involved in Buddhism. So previously, most of the organizational work was focused on the clergy, the Buddhist monks. But now um, there's this idea that, no, we have to get the lay people involved as well so that they're not, you know, for example, uh, drawn into other religions like Protestant Christianity. There was also a European uh, religious sect called the Theosophists. Um, they practice a kind of um, mix of a bunch of different religions together with their own beliefs. They believe in an eternal wisdom teaching behind all religions. They combine beliefs from Buddhism, Hinduism, Western alchemy, magic, esotericism, um, uh, hermetic teachings based on the figure of Hermes Trismegistus, etc., etc., with some of their own teachings. Um, but they were also interested in Buddhism specifically. And there were some theosophists who went to Sri Lanka to learn about Buddhism, and they ended up being involved in the Buddhist revival there. So they helped found the um, Young Men's Buddhist Association, for example. Um, so there was a Buddhist meditation revival in the late 19th century. Buddhist meditation practice never totally died out. Um, it was especially prominent in um, Tibetan Buddhism, some other forms of Vajrayana Buddhism, um, in Zen Buddhism in Japan, and Chan Buddhism in China. But in the Theravada Buddhist countries in Southeast Asia, like Sri Lanka, Burma, Thailand, Laos, and Cambodia, meditation practice had actually gone into decline by the 19th century. So um, there was mainly just practice of chanting and rituals, things like that. Um, so there were monks in the late 1800s who became interested in practicing meditation more systematically, and even if possible, trying to attain Nirvana, through perfecting the meditation practice. Meditation was revived separately in, around the same time, but separately in Sri Lanka, Burma, and Thailand. The Burmese meditation revival is one that had the biggest impact on modern Buddhist understandings of meditation, especially in the West, where you get a lot of talk about mindfulness meditation as if it's a distinctive practice from concentration. And just the way that they practice meditation, the way they teach it, is based on the Burmese uh, Satipatthana uh, meditation technique. Um, there were also various monks uh, that tried to, and, and other people in Buddhism in the 18 and early 1900s, who wanted to adapt Buddhism to the modern age. In China, one of the main early examples of this was the monk 
Dai Xu, who lived between 1890 and 1947. He founded Runjian Fojiao, or Humanistic Buddhism, in China. This is an attempt to make Buddhism less focused on uh, the afterlife or the next life, reincarnation, the welfare of the ancestors, uh, and all these supernatural beliefs about ghosts, other realms, heavenly beings, demons, etc. But to make it more focused on this world and improving conditions for people in this life and because of Buddhist ethics concerns like nonviolence, generosity, compassion, etc. So his um, Renjian uh, Fojiao approach to Buddhism had a big impact. There's a lot of other humanistic Buddhist organizations and sects that were founded in China and what's now Taiwan um, after the time of Dai Shu. Asian Buddhism was oppressed by several secular ideologies and authoritarian regimes in the 20th century, in particular by communist regimes in China, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, and North Korea. In China, the People's Republic of China, or the PRC, was declared in 1949 when the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, came to power after a long civil war with the Kuomintang, or nationalists. The remnants of the Kuomintang fled to the island of Taiwan off the southeast coast of China. Um, communism is an atheist ideology, so they regard religion as a tool of the capitalist class to exploit the workers or the common people by giving them false hope of a better afterlife and thus getting them to accept their current negative material situations, including patterns of exploitation of their labor. And so all of these communist regimes attacked religion to various degrees, including Buddhism. Um, in 1950, Tibet, which previously was a semi-autonomous province in the Chinese Republic and before that various Chinese imperial regimes, uh, the Tibetan autonomy or limited self-rule came to an end. So um, the Communist Party took direct control over the province of Tibet they also attacked Tibetan Buddhism. They destroyed and looted many monasteries and libraries. They executed and tortured some monks. The head of the province of Tibet and also um, a religious leader for many Tibetan Buddhists, the Dalai Lama, fled Tibet with many of his senior monks in 1959. Um, and they, they set up a um, government in exile in Dharamsala, India. The Cultural Revolution in China between 1966 and 1976 was the most destructive period for Chinese Buddhism. Um, the Communist Party in China was led by Mao Zedong, who led them through the civil war with the nationalists and the war against the Japanese imperialist invaders in the 1930s and 40s. So he was the head of the PRC after it was declared in 1949. But he thought that the initial triumph of communism in China had not done enough to destroy the old um, capitalist or at least non-communist culture, including its various Confucian and other elements, including Buddhism. So he initiated the Cultural Revolution in 1966 to try to end all of the old pre-communist ways of thinking, believing, and doing in China. So during the Cultural Revolution, which is very destructive, a lot of Buddhist monasteries and temples were destroyed. There was a destruction of Buddhist icons and scriptures. Many of the monks were forced to become lay people. They were laicized, etc. The Cultural Revolution was also very destructive for other aspects of traditional Chinese cultures, like destruction of Taoist and Confucian temples, etc. Um, so Buddhism... Uh, is still uh, legal in China. You're allowed to practice it. There are uh, many forms of religion are legally permissible, but the government generally controls the hierarchy of the various legal forms of the religion. And Buddhism has declined a lot since the Cultural Revolution. It used to be a religion practiced by the majority of Chinese, albeit combined with Taoism, Confucianism, and other Chinese uh, traditions. Um, like worshiping various uh, local gods and spirits, for instance. But um, 
the the destruction of Buddhism or the decline of Buddhism was probably uh, because of at least two main factors. One, the Cultural Revolution and Communist rule. But two, just the general secularization of society that's come with industrialization and modernization, which you see in other cultures as well. Cambodia was formerly part of French Indochina. It obtained its independence from France in 1953. In 1975, a regime known as the Khmer Rouge took over under its leader Pol Pot. This was a movement that um, originated in communism but blended communist ideology with extreme forms of nationalism. And Pol Pot, his ideal was to create or recreate his idealized vision of an ancient Cambodian society. Um, so he destroyed everything that he thought was incompatible with his vision, including almost all the Buddhist temples and libraries. He murdered many monks and other people that were regarded as enemies of the regime and forced other monks to work for the government. So the Khmer regime, uh, Khmer Rouge regime was very destructive and it, it was brought to an end in 1979 in part as a result of a military intervention from Vietnam, which was also communist at the time, but they regarded the Khmer Rouge as overly unstable. By 1979, there were very few monks left in the country. Nevertheless, despite the almost wholesale destruction, many of the people remained Theravada Buddhists, and so they were able to revive the religion. In 1992, for example, there was a new Buddhist institute that reopened creating a new uh, Buddhist library. Buddhism spread to the West, mainly starting in the late 1800s. The first wave of uh, spread was largely of Theravada Buddhism. One of the early figures of this was Anagarika Dharmapala, the Sri Lankan Buddhist monk involved in the revival of Sri Lankan Theravada Buddhism. He visited Britain in 1893, 1896, and 1907 spreading knowledge of Theravada Buddhism and the Pali scriptures. In 1908, there was a Burmese Buddhist mission to Britain led by a British-born monk, Alan Bennett, who became a Theravada Buddhist monk and assumed the name Ananda Mateya uh, in his role as a monk. He lived between 1872 and 1923. Alan Bennett had previously converted to Buddhism before traveling to Burma, after studying theosophy. So theosophy, even though it's not Buddhist, it has Buddhist elements in it. And it was one of the ways that Westerners, Europeans, North Americans learned about Buddhism, especially in the later 18 and earlier 1900s. Bennett had also read Edwin Arnold's poem, The Light of Asia, written in 1879, which was about the Buddha. So um, there was also the foundation of the Buddhist society of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Um, so that was a really important early center of Theravada Buddhism in um, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Theosophy, as mentioned, played a role in the preservation of Buddhism in Sri Lanka. The Young Men's Buddhist Association was founded by Western Theosophists. In 1924, Christmas Humphreys, uh, who lived between 1901 and 1983, combined a Theosophical Buddhist center uh, in Britain with the Buddhist Society of Great Britain and Northern Ireland to form the Buddhist Lodge. They would call it a lodge, by the way, because um, theosophists are influenced by Freemasonry, which operates out of lodges. This was later renamed the Buddhist Society London in 1943, and now is simply known as the Buddhist Society. But it's kind of like the modern successor to this old lineage of Western Buddhists who were kind of influenced both by Theravada Buddhism and by Theosophy. Um, the next main wave of spread of Buddhism to the West after that of Theravada, which was in the late 18, early 1900s, was the spread of Zen, uh, Japanese Chan or Zen Buddhism. And that started in the 1900s, mainly in the 20s and 30s, but especially, uh, sorry, initially in the 20s and 30s, but especially after the end of World War II, so 1950s and 60s. An instrumental figure in the spread of Zen Buddhism to the United States and other parts of the West was D.T. Suzuki. He lived between 1870 and 1966. He was a layperson, not a monk, but he was a Zen Buddhist 
a practitioner of Zen meditation and a professor of Buddhist philosophy at Otani University in Tokyo. He was literate in English and wrote English language books on Zen Buddhism both before and after World War II. So the existence of those books was one of the main ways that people in the English speaking world learned about Zen Buddhism. Many became interested in Zen, started practicing Zen meditation. Some traveled to Japan to learn and practice Zen meditation. There were also Zen teachers who came, especially after World War II, to spread um, knowledge of Buddhism uh, to the United States and other Western countries. So the main era of the spread of Zen was the 1950s, 1960s, and after. Tibetan Vajrayana also spread to West. This was kind of like the third main wave of um, Buddhist influence on the West. And this was after the year 1959, when the Dalai Lama and the senior Tibetan monks fled to other countries outside of China, to India, Nepal, Bhutan, Europe, and the United States. Nepal and Bhutan are Himalayan nations just south of Tibet, and there are also people there who practice Vajrayana Buddhism, uh, like that uh, of Tibet. In 1967, Chug Yom Trungpa, who lived between 1939 and 1987, and Dr. Akong Tulku Rinpoche founded the Kagyu Samye Ling Monastery in Scotland. So this is an example of how a lot of these Tibetan Buddhist um, refugees, you might say, or migrants, who included some Buddhist uh, monks, they are spreading the teachings of their religion to the West. Another example is 1974, Chugyang Trungpa founded the Naropa Institute in Colorado, which is a Buddhist uh, university. There were many Western converts to Tibetan Vajrayana Buddhism specifically during the 1960s, 70s, and after, including um, some who became monks and nuns. By now, all of the major Asian schools and sects of Buddhism are also present in the West, some of them in communities of immigrants, such as um, Cambodian Buddhists in Southern California, like in Long Beach and elsewhere. So a bit more about the history of Buddhism in the 20th century. In Japan, there were several um, Buddhist clergymen and some whole sects of Buddhism who supported the Japanese imperial government and its war effort during World War II. Um, this is not so surprising. It does conflict with the Buddhist um, ethic of nonviolence or ahimsa, but like many other religions, um, Buddhism sometimes defends wars or other uses of violence if it's thought of as being necessary to protect the Buddhist community. However, there were Buddhists in Japan who actually resisted or critiqued the government's war um, and other imperial activities in the 1930s and 1940s. Um, some of these people were even imprisoned uh, for their efforts. So there was a huge political pressure against um, Buddhists or anyone else trying to critique the government. Um, in Cambodia, after the fall of Pol Pot, there emerged the Coalition for Peace and Reconciliation. This was organized by a Buddhist monk, Mahagosananda. He only survived the Khmer Rouge regime because he was in Thailand in 1975 when they took over. And he just waited them out outside of Cambodia until the fall of the Khmer Rouge in 1979. So this coalition for peace and reconciliation is trying to heal the wounds caused by the Khmer Rouge generally, but also by their persecution and near destruction of Buddhism and Buddhist monks. In the 1990s, there were many Dhamma Yetras or pilgrimages for truth, annual peace walks organized by monks and lay people in the various parts of the country that had been most affected by the conflict. In Sri Lanka in the 1900s, especially the later 1900s, there was a war between um, the government forces, which were controlled by the um, uh, Sinhalese majority. So there's two main ethnic groups in Sri Lanka, the Sinhala who are mostly Buddhist and the uh, Tamil speakers who are mostly Hindu. And the civil war was caused by um, the Tamil Tigers who are a, um, a Tamil a Hindu group who were fighting for independence from Sri Lanka because they thought they were not given equal rights or not respected properly by the majority um, Sinhala government. Um, so 
Uh, this civil war was eventually brought to an end, sadly not through a peaceful uh, reconciliation, but just through the destruction of the Tamil Tigers um, group by the um, Sri Lankan military. During the civil war, which was quite destructive, there were terrorist attacks by the Tamil Tigers and various reprisals um, by the, the, the government forces, etc. Some, uh, many Buddhist monks and lay people supported the government's war. So again, even though Buddhism has a very clear ethic of nonviolence, this doesn't always result in Buddhists um, avoiding war or not um, condoning wars. And this can often happen if they think that Buddhism or the Buddhist population in a given country is under threat. A final example of this is in Myanmar or Burma, when the government started attacking the Rohingyas. These are an ethnic minority that are also Muslim. And a lot of Burmese consider them not authentically Burmese, both because they um, speak a different language uh, and also because they are not Buddhist. When Buddhism is a big part of the national identity in Burma, but um, there were some Buddhist organizations supporting this um, war effort against the Rohingyas uh, in recent decades. So we can talk more about the role of women in Buddhism. Previously, I've mentioned nuns, but I haven't really explained how they operate. The presence of nuns does go back to the time of the Buddha himself. So this is not only relevant to modern Buddhism. The original teaching was that the Buddha gave higher ordination to five women, including his stepmother, Mahapajapati, who had requested it of him. Um, higher ordination means they're fully ordained as renunciates or Buddhist clergy. And there was even a dialogue that occasioned this uh, request being fulfilled because the Buddha actually initially refused to ordain women as monks um, until he was kind of forced to answer to his uh, stepmother, Mahapajapati, the second wife of his father, um, who had joined him um, as, a, as a lay follower. But she asked the Buddha, well, do women have the same potential as men, the same capacity to attain nirvana? And the Buddha said yes. And so she asked, well, why can't Buddhist, um, sorry, why can't Buddhist women become um, monks then or, or nuns? Why can't they become female clergy? And he was reluctant at first to do this. And this may just um, represent the fact that in ancient Indian society, women were definitely looked down upon as second class citizens, so to speak, or not really the equals of men. There is uh, sometimes like purity taboos associated with them that they were somehow more worldly or less pure than men. But eventually he admitted, yes, it is possible for women to put the Dharma put the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path into practice, they can attain Nirvana, and so they should be um, capable to be ordained as nuns. The, the Buddhist term for nun is bhikkhuni in Pali or bhikshuni in uh, Sanskrit. This basically just means a, a female monk. There's also the word teri, which is a female elder. And there are even parts of the Pali canon, the Buddhist scriptures, that are authored by some of these nuns. Uh, for an example of this is the Terry Gata or the poems Gatas of the Terries, the elder nuns. But there's some other um, sutras as well that contain teachings of the nuns. So some of them were even uh, quite respected in the time of the Buddha and that of his immediate uh, successors. So um, this higher ordination for nuns, even though it was a traditional practice, it was based on the original teaching of the Buddha, it has died out in some Buddhist realms, such as Sri Lanka and Burma, and it was never transmitted to Thailand or to Tibet. Um, there is a partial uh, ordination for nuns in Tibet, but they don't have the same status as fully ordained clergy. And um, the higher ordination for nuns was transmitted in uh, East Asian Mahayana Buddhism uh, in China, Korea, Japan, and Vietnam. So you will find fully ordained nuns in those countries. Even without access to full ordination, women have taken vows and lived as nuns or as quasi-nuns in various nations. There are even uh, Tibetan nuns in Tibetan Buddhism. Um, I'm not sure exactly 
their uh, specific classification. They basically live as nuns. They're at least uh, partly ordained. But one of the problems of why it can be hard to get full ordination, even if there's people who want it, is because the traditional practice requires five elder nuns, I believe it is, to preside over the ordination ceremony. And it's kind of a chicken and egg problem because if you don't have fully ordained elder nuns in existence, you can't do the ceremony properly to ordain a new or additional nun. So there's an organization called Sakya Dita, Daughters of the Buddha, um, which is an international organization of Buddhist women founded in 1987. And one of the main purposes of this organization is to um, facilitate full ordination from some women from Theravada countries. And the way they've done this is by getting the cooperation of fully ordained East Asian Mahayana nuns and also the participation of some Theravada monks. So this has led to the uh, revival of the female Sangha in, in some Buddhist countries. However, this is very controversial in some Buddhist countries. In Thailand, women's ordination is taboo or considered sacrilege or very bad by a lot of the traditional clergy and lay people. And that um, cultural element may also relate to the fact that female ordination was never transmitted to Thailand, so it was never a part of their culture. Um, in modern Buddhism, there's also a movement known as engaged Buddhism. This really only dates to the latter half of the 20th century. Engaged Buddhism as a term, I think also is only a few decades old, but it seeks to apply Buddhist ethical and metaphysical principles to social justice issues, such as ending poverty, exploitation, war, oppression, and discrimination. According to Engage Buddhism, meditation or renunciation of the world in certain ways can actually go together with political activism. Um, and this is going against, you might say, a lot of traditional Buddhism, which, which regards the world as something that should be transcended, not redeemed. So Nirvana is outside of samsara. The pure land is another world. Samsara is often thought of as lost or swept away. And yeah, on the one hand, there have been Buddhist ideal monarchs like Ashoka the Great, who is regarded as helping to bring justice and Buddhist ethics to the world. And traditionally, Buddhist kings were regarded as protectors of the Dharma and should live by Buddhist principles in governing society to create a kind of social justice. But this idea that the world can be sort of perfected or that we should try to save it in a deep sense. That's a more modern view. And it's basically influenced by um, Western uh, leftist and progressive politics. Um, there's the International Network of Engaged Buddhists that was founded in 1989 by Sulak Sivaraksa, who is a lay Buddhist from Thailand, and by Thich Nhat Hanh, who's a Buddhist monk from Vietnam. Uh, he passed away recently in 2022. Thich Nhat Hanh uh, practices a form of Buddhism in Vietnam that's based on a Chinese Chan Buddhism. And he had a, a monastery called Plum Village in France that was active for many decades. I mean, it's still around, but he just he's not there anymore. Um, so this is one of the main ways that he uh, was able to reach Westerners. He had Western students in France who came from around the world. He published his books in English and many other Western languages. So he was one of the main uh, teachers of Buddhism to the West in the uh, late 20th and early 21st centuries, as well as being one of the founders of this engaged Buddhism movement. He got involved in it as far back as the 1960s because he was um, an activist for peace during the Vietnam War uh, in the 1960s. And he even met and was allied with other peace activists and civil rights activists like Martin Luther King Jr. Um, so this idea that Buddhist ethics can be used to try to transform our societies, make them more equal, more just, etc. Another example of engaged Buddhism is the Amida Trust, named after Amida Buddha, um, the Buddha of the Pure Land. This is a British organization which draws inspiration from Pure Land Buddhism, but to work towards a pure land here and now which they claim was the original message of the Buddha. 
Um, <laughs> from like a historical or scholarly perspective, I'm skeptical of that. Um, the pure land is another world where the idea is you're escaping our fallen and corrupted world um, with the help of the Buddha of the pure land. But what they're doing is saying we should make this world um, better um, by making it more like the pure land, you might say. And finally, a little bit about interfaith relations between Buddhism and other religions. In Sri Lanka in the 19th century and after, there was a mistrust of Christianity due to the earlier history of Christian missionaries active there. But today, many Buddhists in Sri Lanka and elsewhere participate um, willingly and happily in interfaith conferences and movements. Another example of this new spirit of cooperation is Risho Kosei Kai. This is a Japanese Buddhist lay-led organization founded in 1938. A lot of the um, modern Japanese Buddhist organizations that were founded in the 20th century were led by lay people as opposed to monks. Um, and this is one of the founders of the World Conference on Religion and Peace, which began in 1970. Another example of interfaith relations is the Society for Buddhist Christian Studies, founded in the United States in 1987, and the European Network of Buddhist Christian Studies, founded in 1997. Buddhism has also changed a lot in the 20th and early 21st centuries due to mutual influence between Asian and various Western cultures. An example of this is the spread of Buddhist modernism, um, Buddhist modernism is basically attempting to make uh, Buddhism more compatible with a variety of modern things. One, modern economies and social uh, conditions. So industrialism, the information age, etc., modern ways of living. Two, modern um, moral and political values. Like a lot of Buddhist modernists emphasize things like democracy, social justice, um, equality and liberty for people, all these kinds of modern uh, Western political values, which weren't previously really a strong part of the Buddhist tradition. Um, and another aspect of Buddhist modernism is making aspects of traditional Buddhism, like the cosmology, the belief in gods, demons, and other realms and spirits and things, abandoning or downplaying some of that to make it more compatible with the modern scientific materialist worldview. Um, so that, that's especially influential in the West, but it also originated independently in Asia, like in Sri Lanka among the reformers there in the late 1800s, and uh, in China, like among the humanistic uh, Buddhist reformers there as well. So that's it for our summary of Buddhism. Hopefully it was helpful. Next up is going to be part seven, Chinese religions. Until next time.